yeah, this is Billiam. Uh, I've been gone for a while. Uh, I've gotten a little lost in my work. I'll explain a little bit more later. Oh my god. A briefcase? What's in it? As a fan of the show Lost, I always hold my breath when I bring it up to others. People have opinions. Either they've seen the show and think it's brilliant yet flawed, or they've seen it and think it's a total plane wreck. Option three is people have only heard the title and think it's a ripoff of Survivor. It's not. And its most simple explanation, Lost is a network TV drama about a group of plane crash survivors living on a mysterious island filled with all sorts of weird things, such as a monster in the woods, a mysterious hatch that no one can seem to open, and polar bears. Initially strangers, each episode explores one of the characters in flashbacks, which reveal each one of their fully loaded backstories. While they're stranded somewhere out in the Pacific Ocean, we learn back home in their old lives they were even more lost. However, they have to overcome their differences and different personalities for survival, because if they can't live together, they are going to die alone. In a more complicated explanation, Lost is like every TV show ever made rolled into one spicy little mysterious blunt. The best take I've ever heard on it is that Lost is like progressive rock, going from a simple survival show with sci-fi and fantasy elements to a more hard science fiction show and ending as a spiritual fantasy. It's no wonder why so many dismiss Lost as something that was just made up as it went along. It went on for like six years straight with dozens of storylines that set up an endless stream of mysteries. It was often criticized for raising many any more questions than it answered. Where are we? I've been working on this video for months. Originally, I was gonna cover the entire series in just two videos, but as I kept doing more research and going down the rabbit hole, it's gotten a whole lot longer. While the creators of Lost did initially throw a bunch of ideas to the wall, to say the show was just made up as it went along, as it's often remembered, is an unfair dismissal of the show, in my opinion. This is a multi-part video series. In this first video, I want to do a deep dive just on the show's first season and its history because, well, no one involved really wanted to make it. It was considered to be that stupid island show some ABC president really wanted to get off the ground. But it's only because because of the flexible and collaborative creative process of the first season, quote, making it up as they go along that it ended up being good, in my opinion. The process of figuring out what this stupid island show was really going to be about was a discovery process. But with mystery being such a big element to the show, discovery was kind of the perfect creative process. But even as the creatives were able to discover the story within this stupid island show, they had another obstacle to overcome. The network not allowing them to end the show and actually execute their planned story. Disney and ABC had a hit on their hands, and in network television, that's pretty uncommon. They wanted to milk it for all it was worth, and that meant gargantuan episode orders and the hope that the show would never end. There's an alternate universe where Lost just kept running alongside Grey's Anatomy. Like, that's bonkers. While the mysterious puzzle that is the island is an exciting, overarching narrative, Lost at the start was very much a network TV drama. And I believe the giant island-sized mystery box often overshadows shadows the quality of many of the individual episodes, as well as some of the show's smaller storylines. Uh, the show is streaming in a few places, by the way, depending on where you live. You can find out where things are streaming by Googling it, but I hear if you stop J.J. Abrams in public, he carries around a binder with the complete series on DVD or Blu-ray that he'll lend you. Uh, he keeps the DVDs around because his mom's SUV doesn't have a Blu-ray player in the back. Uh... <laughs> Hey, you know what I just thought? This video isn't long enough. So thank you so much to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video and helping me reach that 10 minute mark. The joke is the video is three hours long. Imagine the VPN like a secure tunnel between your device and the internet. Protect important data like financial information and passwords. Using the internet without a VPN would be like sharing your favorite playlist with the school bully. Yeah, Tears for Fears is the only thing on my Spotify rap this year. 
here, Derek. What, what do you have to say about it? Working on this video for the past several months, I've needed quite the change of scenery, finally. And so I've been working out in public a little bit more, writing and working on this video on the streets of Titusville, Florida in some luxurious cafe. But going out in public means you have to face the horrors of public Wi-Fi. And I never use public Wi-Fi without ExpressVPN. Let me show you what it looks like. There it is. I just hit connect in the app and boom, I'm connected to a secure server. Luckily with ExpressVPN, you can keep your data secure from all the nosy people trying to put their noses into your data. You hear that guy sitting in a truck in the Holiday Inn parking lot? Just because I'm stealing their Wi-Fi doesn't mean you can steal my data. I have ExpressVPN. So if you're interested in protecting your bones, I mean your browsing habits, oops, then click the link in the description, expressvpn.com slash billium to find out how you can get three months free on me. I mean, just kidding. It's on ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN, please don't send me a bill. Thanks, ExpressVPN. <laughs> Will Lost would eventually be more creatively developed and conceptualized by J.J. Abrams and Damon Lindelof. The idea to create a modern island survival show came from ABC executive Lloyd Braun, who wanted to pitch a series that was basically Castaway, the TV drama. A more straightforward island survival concept than Lost was developed called Nowhere. Developed by ABC executive Tom Sherman and writer Jeffrey Lieber and described as a hyper-realistic Lord of the Flies kind of show, everyone hated it. I look at the rewrite, it, it's worse. It's an unmitigated design. Disaster. Nowhere was still being developed as late as January of 2004, but it was clear it wasn't working, so J.J. Abrams was brought in by Disney to help clean it up. Not the last time they'd used that tactic. I started thinking about what a story would be that would be interesting to me about a plane crash and the survivors of a plane crash. Then I had this one idea, which was, you know, what if the island wasn't just an island, and what if they found a hatch? However, enough of the concept, including some of the character ideas, were carried over into Lost, which is why Lieber has a creation credit on the show. Abrams requested some help on the project, and Damon Lindelof, hoping to get a writing job on Abrams' show Alias, came in to help develop it. The only bad news is, it's, we have to do all the work. It's probably a project that isn't gonna go anywhere, but the whole idea was, if you can impress JJ enough, It'll be great maybe for the next one. Maybe he'll give you a job on Alias. Lloyd Braun, who is the president of ABC, mm -hmm. has this stupid idea. She didn't say stupid, but she it, it was sort of like this crazy idea. The network had jumped through such hoops to bring this idea into fruition, and it kept not working. Mm. And, and this idea about a plane crash on an island, and he, we want to do Survivor the drama series. And I said, tell me more about this idea. And she said, that, that's it, pretty much. And I, I started coming up with some ideas about, they would be all about mystery, you know, the mystery of who the people were that were in the crash and the mystery of what the island was that they crashed on. With only Lloyd Braun and executive Tom Sherman having faith in the project, Abrams and Lindelof decided to go ham with the idea and just threw anything at the wall that would stick to create an engaging premise, believing the show would never actually get picked up. Right. And so. JJ would say things like, oh, they, there's a polar bear and, 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 oh, they find a hatch. And I'd be like, oh, that's cool. And he's like, and they spend the whole season, ba they found a hatch in the ground. They spend, they, but they have, they can't open it. They spend the whole season, like, trying to open this thing up because they don't, you know, they don't have any tools or explosives or, and I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. And he's like, and then finally in the season finale, they open this thing up and I'm like, what's in there? And he's like, I don't, I don't know. He's like, you, you'll figure it out. Despite all the wild and crazy ideas, Lost pre-production time was actually pretty low. From scripting to presenting a full edit of the show, the 90 minute pilot had to come together in only 11 weeks. It's the last week of January and we're talking about a pilot. All the other pilots have been ordered at Christmas time a month ago. So they're all casting and they have these scripts, you know, things that are important to have. While a few of the character ideas were present from the beginning, much of the primary cast would be conceptualized and created through the casting process itself, with characters being heavily adjusted or even tailor-made for many of the actors directly. After a little bit of scouting, the island of Oahu in Hawaii was chosen as the filming location. In fact, production started so quickly, the role of Kate had not been solidified. They hadn't cast it. They wanted newcomer Evangeline 
Lily, who had never worked in TV or film before, but a video audition had impressed the nerdy boys, JJ and Damon, so much that they wanted to cast her. The only problem is they had to pull out all the legal stops to get her a work visa from Canada. So they began filming without her. At the time, ABC was ranked fourth overall out of all the American networks. This was not the time to be making big, bold, expensive purchases. They should be doubling down on The Bachelor. Disney CEO Michael Eisner said Lost was a crazy idea that was never going to work, calling it another crazy Abrams project. He reportedly gave it two out of 10. Then president of ABC, Bob Iger, who apparently had beef with Lloyd Braun when he dared to say Iger didn't have much to do in the creation of The Bachelor, the network's only hit program at the time, said it was a waste of time. Braun pushed forward, aiming to spend enough to make the project too expensive to cancel. So the production went ahead and Lloyd Braun was rumored to actually have been fired for greenlighting what was the most expensive TV pilot ever made. Want an idea of how expensive it was? J.J. Abrams was a rising star, critically speaking, but besides, like, Armageddon, his stuff was not really the most popular. At the time, many outlets were questioning Disney's decision to purchase ABC at all, which was one of their regular industry-changing splurges. The Lost Pilot would initially premiere at Comic-Con in 2004, receiving instant critical acclaim and fan speculation from the event on the internet. Lost premiered on ABC the same day the first episode takes place, and eight days after Tears for Fears released their final studio album, Everybody Loves a Happy Ending, September 22nd, 2004. Tears for Fears. Could you imagine going into September of that year not having booked Tears for Fears? ABC executives were quivering. Tears for Fears. Ellen had them. The Today Show had them. Conan O'Brien had them. I would have quit too, Lloyd. The opening title is like an ominous portal and really reminds me of the floating words in the Twilight Zone. The word lost comes into focus from a black void. An ominous hum rises as the word gets closer, only coming into focus as the whole image leaves the frame. A perfect visual for the show. Our main character, Jack, wakes up disoriented in the middle of a forest. A white Labrador runs past him. He notices a bottle of vodka in his pocket and he makes his way to the beach toward the sound of screaming. He comes across across the wreckage of Oceanic Flight 815 on the beach and immediately jumps into action to help the others in distress. He performs CPR on an unconscious woman, helps an injured pregnant woman get away from falling debris, and gets people away right before the jet engine explodes. That night, they determined from their wreck site, which only included the plane's fuselage, that the plane must have broken in half over the island sometime during their flight from Sydney, Australia to Los Angeles, California. They know they're in the Pacific, but they don't know where exactly. So they decide to go out the next day to find the cockpit to see if they could find the black box or a radio, but their night is interrupted by these loud sounds in the woods and the flattening of trees. A monster. Pilot also introduces the flashbacks. We learn that Jack had gotten an extra bottle of liquor from a kind flight attendant, and we also learn that the woman he performed CPR on was sitting next to him on the plane. She was nervous about the turbulence, and Jack promised to keep her company while she waited for her husband to come back. He was in the back of the plane when it broke in half. The next day, Jack goes out with Charlie and Kate to find the cockpit, which they do. The pilot is alive, and he reveals they were flying off course for hours, getting lost. Okay, uh, just for clarity's sake, when I refer to Lost as a verb instead of the show, I will be saying loosened instead. I, I just don't want you to get loosened in this video because of how many times I say Lost. So they get loosened somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. By the time we, we hit turbulence, we were a thousand miles off course. They're looking for us in the wrong place. They're like, hey, pilot man, sure glad you're alive. Sure happy to have you in the cast of the monster gets him. We learned in a flashback that Charlie wanted to go to the cockpit to retrieve his heroin from the bathroom, which he tried flushing on the plane. They run away and make it back to camp where things are tense. After Walt finds a pair of handcuffs in the woods, everyone starts pointing fingers and Sawyer starts a fight with Saeed. Tell everyone what you told me. Tell them that I crashed the plane. Go on, tell them I made the plane crash. buddy. Look, my kid found these in the jungle. And this guy was sitting in the back row of business class the whole flight, never got up. Jack's been gone for like 10 seconds and things go crazy. And now there's a dude with a heavy piece of shrapnel in his chest from the airplane who Kate is suspiciously worried about. Saeed suggests they try to get a better radio signal at the top of the mountain. So Sawyer, Charlie, Kate, and bickering siblings, Boone and Shannon go with them to test it out. On the way, they're attacked by a polar bear, which Sawyer shoots, revealing he found a gun in the wreckage and also revealing there's polar bears on the island. Guys, this isn't just a bear. 
Saeed accuses Sawyer of being the criminal, but in a flashback, we find out it was actually Kate, mystery solved. In a final scene, they get to the top of the mountain and turn the radio on, only to hear a message spoken in French repeating itself, which Shannon is able to translate as a distress call. They're able to calculate from a sequence of numbers at the end of the message that the distress call has been playing for over 16 years, which prompts the most important question of the show, the grand mystery. Guys, where are we? The two-part pilot does an incredible job of weaving in all sorts of interesting mysteries and even providing little answers to encourage the audience to keep watching, such as revealing Kate is the criminal and she was worried about the injured dude because he's the marshal who arrested her. And his presence on the plane is where Sawyer got the gun from, another answer. As a two-part episode, the extra runtime gives the audience quite a bit of air to breathe with these characters and to get familiar with them, if only a little, and if only to build intrigue with some of them. Whoa. Do you want to know a secret? What the fuck? Sawyer's got a letter. Jack and Kate have a little intimate moment where she stitches him up after the plane crash. She doesn't want to, she's afraid, and he tells her to just breathe for five seconds. Be afraid, and then let it go. Something she has to do again later on when she runs from the monster. It's like, these two. Will they or won't they, am I right? He seems like a mentally stable fella. Seems. With the pilot receiving great feedback before its airing, ABC went ahead and ordered a cautious half season. But still, the threat of an early cancellation loomed if this overly expensive project didn't work right out of the gate. Luckily, Damon had a rising star, J.J. Abrams, to help him out. The third or fourth day of editing, I walked into the editing room and J.J. was sitting there with Tom Cruise. And he's like, hey, Damon, this is Tom. <laughs> What is Tom Cruise doing here? Why is he watching The Lost Pilot? Are he and JJ friends? Oh shit, you know, b before the paint is dry on Lost, JJ is announcing he, he has been handpicked to direct his first feature, which is gonna be Mission Impossible 3. Right. It's made very clear to me that JJ is not going to be running the show with me. Come on, come on. Many of the island plot lines early on feature challenges of survival. They're rationing what food and water they have left over from the plane before going to fishing, hunting boar, picking tropical fruit, and ultimately they find a cave system which provides more shelter. But the increased focus on shelter ultimately creates a debate over prioritizing shelter versus rescue. And for that, we need to organize everyone to keep that signal fire burning while others scout the island for supplies. Digging in anywhere else is suicide. It is the only source of fresh water we've found, Saeed and staying on the beach in the sun without water. That's not suicide. While many of the logistical needs of survival remains a concept in the background, most of the conflicts stem from within the survivors themselves. As survivors of a commercial plane crash, most of the castaways are total strangers. They don't go around sharing things about themselves or necessarily any information about the island. We're lost on an island, running from boars and monsters, freaking polar bears. Polar bears. You didn't hear about the polar bear? While we learn more about the characters in depth through their flashbacks on the island and to each other, they're all sort of like clue characters. Fine, I'm the criminal. You're the terrorist. We can all play a part. Who you wanna be? While the total number of survivors is around 49, the main cast is made up of 14 central characters, but occasionally another guest actor will be cast to play one of the lesser important characters. Our leading guy is the Dr. Jack, an awkward spinal surgeon who has a desperate need to save people. He has terrible bedside manner, he's awkward, but his actions during the plane crash make everyone look to him as the leader. Despite Jack feeling like he doesn't really know how to lead, he gives everyone a group philosophy. And God knows how long we're gonna be here, but if we can't, live together. We're gonna die alone. Kate is a criminal on the run from the law. She can never stay in one place for too long. That's her deal. But now she has nowhere to go. She's on an island. She's athletic and has some survival skills, including hunting and tracking, which makes her part of the A-team. But who will she choose? The awkward little Durlsack Jack or the rebellious Sawyer? 
Sawyer is the hot-tempered southern con man who makes a lot of enemies early on because one, racism comes very easily to him, and two- What are you doing in here? Trick or treat, same as you. You're looting. Ah. You say potato. He loots and then continues to hoard a lot of the necessary supplies. He's an asshole, always coming up with different insulting, sometimes charming nicknames. John Locke, the hunter who believes he has a spiritual connection to the island. Here's two sides. One is light. One is dark. Hurley, the friendly guy who's always calling people dude. Uh, dude? Hurley is always concerned about everyone and is looking out for people's best interests in a genuine way. Saeed, the soldier. He's the electronics guy who initially fixes the plane's transceiver. Some people have problems. <laughs> Some people have problems, us. Him. You're okay. I like you. You're okay too. <laughs> Holding on to a portrait of the woman he loved, we can only wonder what happened to her. Jin and Sun, a Korean couple who have trouble communicating with the rest of the survivors. Jin is a skilled fisherman, and Sun eventually plants a garden with fruits, vegetables, and medicinal herbs. Jin's hot temper and violent outburst causes friction between him and much of the rest of the group initially, and it's very clear he's controlling of Sun, who seems to calmly go along with it, despite having more of a desire than him to make a connection with the other survivors. However, she reveals to a select few she actually knows English, a secret which she has to keep from her husband. Michael and Walt, a father and son who have recently been reunited after 10 years. Michael is an architect and worked in construction. He helps to establish some of their living structures. Walt, he has like weird powers or something and will occasionally say cryptic stuff or you mention something and it'll appear or he's reading a comic book with the polar bear in one scene and then the polar bear attacks the group in the next. The dog is his, the dog is Vincent. Boone and Shannon, two wealthy step siblings who are constantly bickering and trying to involve themselves in the larger issues issues at hand because they both feel like they have nothing to contribute. Claire, a young pregnant woman who was traveling to America to give up her baby for adoption. But now she can't give up her baby. She's on an island. Charlie, a former one hit wonder rock star with a heroin addiction who's now literally washed up like a shore. An island. He's found his heroin, but there's only so much of it left. And Rose, an older woman who won't let go of the belief that her husband, who was in the bathroom in the back of the plane during the crash, has survived. While the castaways are very slow to get to know each other, we get to see them for the multifaceted people they are by exploring their checkered pasts and flashback. While the grander nature of the island itself creates a lot of questions that are easy to speculate on, so much so the characters themselves regularly do it. Was it a dinosaur? It wasn't a dinosaur. You say you didn't see it. I didn't. So how do you know it wasn't a dinosaur? Because dinosaurs are extinct. Oh. The layers of mysteries get even more intensely dense when you start to explore how the characters' flashbacks and backstories are interwoven into their time on the island. The idea behind writing a show with so many characters came from the fact that network TV demanded a lot of episodes. If they wanted a continuing stream of storylines, they needed a lot of characters to write for. The flashbacks all have their own feeling to them. Characters all have their own unique musical themes, and with their varied backstories, it feels like they were all in their own show before landing on the island. Jack's flashbacks are sort of like medical dramas, Kate is like the fugitive going from place to place on the run from the law, and Sun and Jin have this intense family crime drama. It's crazy. This crash was the best thing that ever happened to them because their lives were such shit before the crash that they're sort of in no rush to, to get off the island. The flashbacks also function to take the show off the island while also not letting the characters leave the island. And they do try. When I first saw Lost as a kid, when they started building the raft to get off the island halfway through season one, this joke from the Fairly Odd Parents rang through my head. Without my emotions, I am thinking quite logically. For example, the reason they couldn't build a boat on Gilligan's Island is because it would end the series. So effectively, the flashbacks actually get them off the island each week, and huge compliment to the crew, this always blows my mind. The entire show is filmed in Hawaii. They achieve all the different locations, Iraq, London, the American Midwest, Korea, through selective framing, set decoration, and visual effects. It's incredible. One of the most important functions of the flashback is to reveal more about the characters, but character revelations themselves are an important part to the lost mystery 
web and where I actually believe J.J. Abrams' mystery box works best. For those who are unaware, the mystery box is a way J.J. Abrams describes using mystery as a storytelling technique to engage the audience. For those who are aware, please be rest assured this video will not be about the mystery box. Essentially, it's just making your audience ask questions that keep them engaged with your story. Abrams uses a literal mystery box he bought from a magic store to illustrate the idea. The premise behind the mystery magic box was the following. $15 buys you $50 worth of magic, which is a savings. Now, I bought this decades ago, and I'm not kidding. If you look at this, you'll see uh, it's never been opened. He bought it and has no idea what's in it, and that's what he loves about it. He has to wonder. He's like, you, you'll figure it out. Um, and, and, and so, uh, I think for the, for the first year in particular, it was come up with an interesting question and worry about the answer later. But that created a complete and utter terror in the creative process. The pilot presents the island as one big mystery magic box, which continues to unfold as characters discover more about it. Did you see it? No, it was right behind me, man. Dove into the bushes. How does something like that happen? That can't be a polar bear. It's, it's a, a polar, polar bear. bear. Wait a minute. Polar bears don't usually live in the jungle. Spot on. Someone else was stranded here? Maybe they came for them. Someone came. Why is it still playing? Guys. If we had to make the pilot in the in the in which was a two-hour movie essentially in 13 weeks. All we were able to do was basically talk about the pilot. 11 weeks after that point, we delivered them the two hour, finished, completed, shot, edited, scored, pilot of Lost. So. No, you didn't. Yeah. What the fuck? True fact. Over the course of the season, they have close encounters with the monster, run into the French woman who left the radio distress call. Then there's just all this weird phenomena around the place, like magnetic interference, which makes compasses point away from north. And some people in the camp start hearing whispers in the woods occasionally. Walt's powers, John's visions later in the season. But sometimes the mystery box is as simple as the group finding a locked suitcase one episode, or Michael just cherishing a wooden box for a few episodes. And of course, the whole fucking island turns into a mystery box. You need this more than I do. When John and Boone find a concrete hatch in the middle of the woods. And while many of the grander questions of lost mysteries have been critiqued for their final resolutions or lack of resolutions, I love how the mystery box plays into character development. The character backstories are told out of order, a la Pulp Fiction, with the fallout of a character's actions often being more important than what caused them. But the cause creates a good mystery. We don't know yet what Kate did, just that she's dangerous and on the run. In the first Jack-centric episode, White Rabbit, Jack is told by his mother his father went missing. I can't. Jack doesn't want to be the one to go find him, but his I mother can't. says it's his responsibility to go after, quote, what he you did. Have to say, I can't. Not after what you did. So we know Jack has done something to sour the relationship with his father, but this episode is just about his trip to Australia and the guilt he feels around it when it's revealed his father is dead. But the revelation of what he did is left for an episode later that season. Just the question of why all these characters were in Sydney to begin with is a huge mystery. Only Claire is Australian after all, and let me tell you, no one was just taking a vacation. Even Hurley was trying to find the source of a series of cursed numbers he won the lottery with. Laid out in chronological order, a lot of what happens in the flashbacks are pretty standard character drama stuff, but this out of order storytelling and commitment to layering in mysteries as the story goes on makes so many of the character revelations exciting. I absolutely think the mystery box deserves a lot of the critique thrown at it, but as a tool for audience engagement, it's effective, especially when you're able to solve mysteries at a similar rate you introduced them, which Lost arguably does not do. Mystery green screen. <sighs> you gonna film a video? I just wanna vibe. 
Don't look at my pumas. In terms of revelatory flashbacks, nothing beats the fourth episode of the series, Walkabout. John Locke is sort of a weirdo in the first few episodes. He's just sort of vibing. In this scene, Kate is taking hiking boots off a dead man. Like, dude. People died. <laughs> Michael doesn't like that Walt has taken a liking to John, especially because Michael himself doesn't know Walt all that well. But Locke helps Michael out by making a dog whistle to help them find Vincent, and then he gives Michael the credit. One night, the camp is raided by four to 50 feral hogs, and the next morning, everyone starts realizing the food supply is low. Locke decides it's time to hunt. There are plenty of things on this island we can use for sustenance. And exactly how are we gonna find the sustenance? <laughs> We hunt. Excuse me? Keep in mind, this is three years after 9-11. Knives on plane is peak suspicious. John gives this monologue about killing pigs. He has this weird confidence to him. What's his deal? You call me paranoid, but anyone who packs a suitcase full of knives? Yeah. Yes. Colonel Locke, is this line secure? His first flashback just builds intrigue. Line secure, GL-12, go ahead. Mm. Intriguing. Kate and Michael track through the jungle with Locke and they discuss learning to hunt with their fathers and Kate makes note of Locke's name, John Locke. Who is this profound individual? In John's flashback, we see the commander name was just a reference to a board game he and an office friend play at lunch. He works in this dead end job at a box factory with an asshole boss and talks about his dreams of going on a walkabout. A guided tour through the Australian outback meant to help one find themselves and test their resolve spiritually. His boss says he'll never be able to do it, but John is determined. Why? It was his destiny. That's what you think you got, old man? Destiny. Just don't tell me what I can't do. What was that, John? Excuse me? What? He retells the story of the interaction with so much triumph. Like, this was a big moment of defiance in his life, despite it just being like an under the breath comment. Getting to finally tell Randy off was uh, life changing. Oh, John bought two tickets to Australia. One for him and one for his partner, I guess. Helen? John, we've talked about this. I yeah, like I you, know. and I've enjoyed talking with you oh, these so past fine. few months. Eight months. I'm not allowed to meet customers. A customer? Is, uh... Is, is that is that what I am to you? John Locke's flashbacks are just like peeling away the layers of sadness. On the island, they're hunting boars, but the boars hunt back and Kate and Michael have to retreat, but John keeps going. There's a crazed determination to him. Don't tell me what I can't do. Oh no, the monster is gonna get him. John, there's the monster, you and I, we see it. Back at camp, there's all sorts of shenanigans going on, and Claire starts to suggest to Jack that he should potentially hold a funeral service for those who died on the plane, as well as comfort the widowed Rose, who's still convinced her husband is still alive. But Jack keeps finding it hard to hold a conversation in this episode because this mysterious man in a suit and white sneakers keeps appearing. Kate and Michael go back into camp, and Kate lets Jack know about the monster and Locke, but it's those damn white sneakers again. Jack follows the dude into the woods, only for John to triumphantly return turn, pig in hand. Fuck. With Jack unwilling to lead the funeral service, Claire decides to be the one to do it. While everyone else sees being on the island as a problem, John sees the island as a special place. During the funeral pyre, as everyone else is mourning the dead, John watches over everyone, triumphant and happy. Like, dude, people died. Then we get one final flashback. John arrives at the office for his walkabout expedition tour, but he's told he can't go because of his condition. Hey, don't you walk away from me. You don't know who you're dealing with. Don't ever tell me what I can't do, ever. Cut to John waking up during the crash, realizing he can feel his legs again. And in perfect sync with Michael Giacchino's score, he takes his first steps again in who knows how long and helps out with the wreck from the pilot. With the realization that he's somehow been healed by landing on the island, John feels a sort of a spiritual connection to it. And just like how he saw the walkabout trip with this tour group as a part of his personal destiny, he quickly begins to see the island in a similar way as well, interpreting his healing as being chosen in a way 
a religious experience. Being a disaster show with monsters and plane wrecks, it was easy to think Lost might be something like a Roland Emmerich film. There was a kind of unexpected, hopeful twist to the end of this episode. And they knew this idea was special as J.J. Abrams just said oh my god when Damon Lindelof pitched the idea to him. Written by season 1 executive producer David Fury, Walkabout is one of Lost's best episodes and laid the groundwork for a lot of the group dynamics, with Locke being an important player and Jack being uneasy around him, but also having Michael and Kate accompany John on the hunt is a great inclusion for the episode. Kate and John are more adept than Michael in the outdoors, so we start to get an idea of everyone's skill set. Kate climbs trees a lot, like they just constantly write in excuses in the show because Evangeline Lilly is just doing that. That's her. Dang. We also start getting silly beach camp stories with Hurley and Charlie fitting nicely into a comedic relief role when Charlie is conned by Shannon to catch a fish for her. Shannon convinces Charlie to catch the fish to prove to Boom that she can take care of herself. It's wonderful. Well, mysteries are definitely a motivating factor for long-term viewers, like how did John get healed? What's the deal with this island? The progressing relationships at the beach camp and the flashback stories, weirdly enough, are the most complex an intricate part of the show. And as we all get to know the characters and see them interact, our curiosity to see what makes them tick goes up. We gotta know everyone's deal. This isn't just an excuse to watch Lost Billy. You gotta post a video. About to enter some kind of town. Who knows? Maybe it's on an island as well. We'll see. The first episode following the pilot, Tabula Rasa, truly introduces us to the flashback structure, showing us Kate's time in Australia before being apprehended by the marshal, making friends with a farmer who lets her stay with her before he discovers her identity and turns her in for the reward. On the island, Jack and Hurley discover Kate's secret and the marshal warns him that Kate is dangerous, with a flashback revealing Kate had crashed the guy's car when she realized what was happening, the farmer's car. The marshal says he wants to talk to Kate, asking her what she wanted to ask him on the plane before the crash. I have one favor to ask. Really? This ought to be good. With Kate wanting to know if the farmer ever got his reward money for turning her in. See, she's nice after all. But then Sawyer goes in to shoot the marshal. You shot him in the chest? I was aiming for his heart. You missed. Man, is he still breathing? You perforated his lung. Something which Jack then has to deal with. By killing him. While Jack initially expresses anger towards Kate, he tells her something which becomes an important theme throughout the show. It doesn't matter, Kate, who we were, what we did before this, before the crash. Three days ago, we all died. We should all be able to start over. Tabula Rasa essentially means clean slate, a really important theme in the early seasons. However, their problems seem to follow them because they can't look introspectively and face their problems on a fundamental level. Which is why so much of the conflict of the first season just stems from the camp itself. Sawyer stealing stuff, Saeed being knocked unconscious while trying to triangulate a radio signal with the others, and Michael's boat being burned before they have to start building a second boat. However, despite the conflict, mutual support and the bumper sticker, coexistence really is what ends up being the most prominent themes for storylines in much of these early seasons. A common theme in the flashbacks is the story being used to reflect growth or show that a character is stuck in their old ways. From the beginning, the island being purgatory was a common theory as a grandiose explanation for it all. Three days ago, we all died. Oh, I figured it out. They're in purgatory. You went to purgatory, my friend. I forgot all about purgatory. There's a common theme with all the characters that they're unable to let go of something from their past or unable to come to peace with something. Just like the Tears for Fears B side track always in the past, these characters can't stop thinking always in the past. Sawyer holds on to a letter he wrote to the man he claims is responsible for his parents' death. John grew up in foster care and is unable to accept how horrible his biological father is after they reconnect. And Charlie has a heroin addiction, but only one bag of heroin 
row and left. A few years after the show ended, an early pitch Bible was leaked online. Apparently, ABC was worried because J.J. Abrams' earlier show, Alias, was very genre heavy, and ABC thought it was a bit alienating to regular audiences. So a pitch Bible was created that guaranteed all the mysteries and Lost, including the monster, would have a real scientific explanation, and that there wouldn't be heavy serialization. Instead, there'd be some overarching plot lines from every season, which would be easy to follow, and romances and relationships that would develop over the course of the series. A lot of these ideas were clearly abandoned early on, or it was just used to help the show get picked up by ABC. While the Pitch Bible came up with a lot of ideas which were not expanded upon, including ending season one with a hurricane and having a mysterious fog descend from the top of the mountain with alien-like eggs growing out of it. It is an important document though, because it was the first time they sat down and tried planning out this thing as a series after shooting the two-hour pilot. We never would have sold that show. If we had gone in and pitched everything that I, that JJ and I had come up with in that room, heavily serialized, probably genre elements, non-linear storytelling, huge sprawling ta uh, cast, um, you know, can't shoot it in LA or Vancouver, you know, uh, we can't make this. Right. No sets. No. However, that's not to say season one doesn't have a very episodic feeling at times. And frankly, a lot of the time, it seems like they're just writing the Twilight Zone on an island. Jack? Take the fifth episode, White Rabbit. This episode begins with the flashback that establishes Jack's foundational need to save people. He's not just a dude who acted in the moment. This is always who he's been. In this way, the flashback structures sort of serve as an introduction to the characters in the same way Rod Serling's narration does in The Twilight Zone. Should have stayed down, Jack. When the characters start having their own personal stories, we get to know them more. Cut to Jack, someone is drowning and Jack runs out to save them. It's Boone. Jack brings him back to the beach and Boone's like, did you save the girl I went out to get? She's drowning out there. Shit! Jack swims back out, but it's too late. The no-name woman dies. Claire tells us her name. I don't fucking remember. Her name was Joanna. Back at the beach, things are getting really intense. The water supply is dwindling, causing people to turn on each other. Everyone looks to Jack to lead, but he's losing it! <laughs> As a continuation of Walkabout, the episode before, he continues to see the man in the suit. In a flashback, this is revealed to be none other than Jack's father, who tells Kid Jack after the fight he got into that he doesn't have what it takes to be a hero because unlike him, Jack can't handle failure. Then he says some special kind of fucked up shit only a fucked up dad could say to a kid. I had a boy on my table today. I don't know, maybe a year younger than you. After the boy died, I was able to wash my hands and come home to dinner, you know, watch a little Carol Burnett laugh till my sides hurt. How do I do that, Jack? Because I have what it takes. A true sociopath. Cut to years later, Jack's mother asks him to go find his dad who's gone missing in Australia. It's Jack's responsibility to go after what he did. Back on the island, Claire has collapse of dehydration, so John goes out to find Jack, who's not having a good time. In Australia, in the past, Jack's father has been missing from his hotel room for a few days. The mystery unfolds. John saves Jack, and they have a little talk about leadership responsibilities, with Jack mimicking what his dad told him all those years ago. You don't have what it takes. You just don't have what it takes. I don't know how to help them. I'll fail. I'll I don't have what it takes. Jack tells John he's chasing someone, but he explains it away as a hallucination. But John thinks differently about it. He tells him to go find whatever he's chasing. Is your white rabbit a hallucination? Probably. But what if everything that happened here happened for a reason? The relationship between John and Jack remains a crucial element in the show's story. John has accepted the supernatural nature of the island with open arms, really wide open arms, too open if you ask me. But Jack is always putting up blinders when he sees anything bizarre. John tells him to return when he finds what he's looking for. 
Jack sits by the fire and cries for a bit. Flashback to Jack identifying his father in a morgue who isn't just taking a nap, but is dead, as it turns out. Jack stops crying. His dead dad is back. He follows him, being led to the caves where running water is heard. Jack finds part of the plane's cargo, including the casket. Flashback again. Jack is arguing with an airport clerk about checking his father's coffin on the plane. He's desperate to get it on the plane because he just needs to bury his father. What did you do, Jack? Can you live with this guilt? He opens his father's casket, which is empty. He just needs to bury his father. He destroys the casket in a fit of rage, unable to bury his father and his guilt. What he did to him. The man just needs to bury his father. Back at camp, everyone's fighting, but finally, Jack, the dad of the beach camp, is back. The episode ends with Jack stepping up as the leader officially and giving one of the most iconic and character-defining speeches in the series. We can't, we can't do, do this. this. Every, Every man, man for himself, himself isn't is going to work. work. We, we need to figure, need to figure out how we're, out how we're going here. to survive. Now I found, now I found water. Cave water. Fresh water. Back where my dead dad was. If you're if scared you of my dead dad, then find another way to contribute. contribute. We were all strangers we before, were strangers. but we know each but other now. now. Who knows how long we'll be on this fucked up bitch of an island. But if we can't live together, then we're going to die alone. The flashbacks and the initial reveals about the characters sort of serve a similar role to Rod Serling's narration in The Twilight Zone, just giving us some essential insight into what kind of person they are so we can truly appreciate their personal struggle. It's even got the twist at the end between Locke being revealed to have been paralyzed and Jack's father not being in the casket. Imagine, if you will, a grown man, but he's actually a baby boy. Dr. Jack Shepard, MD. His boss, Dr. Daddy Shepard. MD. Daddy's gone, and now he's only left his son as a broken man, merely trying to pick up the jigsaw pieces of his broken life. But Jack, he feels the guilt of his father, who is dead, but actually alive on the island, walking around, possibly. The casket's empty. Weird. The episode of The Moth is sort of the most season one episode of Lost you can get. In an earlier episode, John had found out about Charlie's heroine and decided to tell him where he found his guitar if he gives up the bag, which he does. In this episode, Charlie starts having withdrawals and asks John for his drugs back. And John gives him this sort of corny TV setup. He'll give Charlie the heroin on the third time he asks as a test. Then, in a moment so on the nose, it hurts. John uses a cocoon to explain to Charlie the growth he's about to go through. He'll soon emerge as a beautiful moth, more beautiful than even a butterfly. I help it. Take my knife, gently widen the opening, and the moth would be free, but it would be too weak to survive. Since Charlie was a fan favorite character, this episode was heavily promoted and saw the biggest numbers of the first season thus far. Fans wanted to know his backstory and in it we learn about Charlie's past as a rock star, wanting to quit and lean more into his Catholic faith right before making it big and getting into all sorts of debauchery all over again. His brother starts getting into drugs and eventually Charlie in a spiral of depression also gets into them. But when his brother quickly decides to quit the band, go sober and move to Australia after having a kid, Charlie is left alone with his addiction. He goes to Australia to get the band back together. The band's not getting back together. Uh-oh, Charlie asks for his heroin a third time, but decides to dramatically cast it into the fire. Say no, no drugs. At the same time, the moth emerges from its cocoon, floating over the flames. After this episode, Charlie doesn't really struggle too much with his addiction for the rest of the season, which sort of breaks the realism behind this kind of story. And between that and the super on-the-nose moth metaphor, which Dominic Monaghan himself roasts so eloquently in the commentary for the episode. Why is this episode called The Moth? Well, it's an interesting question you asked me that, Damon. Um, there's there's many reasons why it's called the moth. I mean, you you could look at the idea that, you know, Locke is now pointing to a, a moth cocoon, and that, you know, in in a kind of way, Charlie represents the moth, the emerging moth, the the young moth that has yet have to have the strength to kind of break out into the world on his own. I would think, uh, and then also obviously there's the moth at the end that leads him out of right. the tunnel. So there's some incredibly metaphorical writing nuances in here that that really spoke to me like like the the sea in a shell. I think it's easy to remember a lot of these plot lines as a bit hokey, and they absolutely are. 
Loss can be very hokey, but still, its execution is what matters. The moth monologue John gives is the hokey pokey, but the culmination of the excellent performances by the actors, the score by Michael Giacchino, and the great character direction brings so much to the story. Terry O'Quinn is so intense in his delivery, and Dominic Monaghan's desperation is so clear. And at this point, he's such a likable character that we want to see him get through this struggle, and by the end of the episode, I'm so relieved and proud of Charlie. It seems making peace is a common theme in character stories, and the island has a funny way of making the characters face their past in all sorts of quirky ways. Like in the season finale, Charlie discovers a crashed airplane full of heroin. <laughs> that quirky island. In a later episode, the whole group gets suspicious of Sawyer having Shannon's inhaler, which she has been missing since they crashed. In a pretty brutal episode, which is paired with Sawyer's first flashback, Saeed tortures Sawyer to find the inhaler, which it turns out he does not have. Ashamed of his actions, Saeed chooses to banish himself, going off to explore the rest of the island. After following a mysterious cable leading from the ocean and up into the woods, he springs a trap, is captured, and then tortured by Danielle so, the French woman. Said is being accused of being one of the others, the mysterious island inhabitants. As a continuation of a scene first featured in Walkabout, Rousseau asks Said about a picture in his pocket revealed to be Said's childhood love, Nadia. Rousseau has been in the jungle alone for 16 years and she's hungry, but that doesn't affect the plot too much. She's so hostile towards the supposed others because they apparently took her child 16 years ago. Besides that fateful night, she's never met them, only having heard them as whispers in the woods. Rousseau talks about a sickness that affected the rest of her research team. She was forced to kill her husband, who started acting violently after being infected. And just to slip in some extra mystery, she mentions getting dynamite from a place called the Black Rock. Oh, intriguing. They discuss the plane crash, and Rousseau wants to believe Saeed is telling the truth about who he is, that he's not one of the others but she finds herself unable to believe him. They walk out of Rousseau's bunker and Rousseau gives Saeed an unloaded rifle, leading him into the same trap as she led her husband into. She asks what happened to Nadia, where Saeed reveals after he tried to help her escape, she was reported dead. Rousseau believes him and begins to connect with Saeed's guilt and grief. Saeed invites Rousseau to come back to the camp with him, but she decides to remain solitary. She believes she isn't ready to rejoin society. She might be right, she's pretty crazy. Said grabs some of Rousseau's notes, including the map of the island. He dismisses her claim of there being others who live on the island, but as he's running back into camp, he can't tell if what he's hearing is just the rustling of the wind in the leaves, or the voices of the others who hide and whisper in the woods. Once again, like Jack, the island is making him face a physical manifestation of his guilt, which is a very Twilight Zone type setup. Portrait of a man holding a portrait of a woman in his pocket. Saeedra, age, I don't know. He was forced to torture the woman that he loves. Now he's being tortured too. Doesn't love that so much. Well, the kind of character drama and twists and turns the story takes can easily be compared to The Twilight Zone. Lost is also similar in that it's interested in telling stories with social themes. While The Twilight Zone was very much made in post-war America, Lost is very much of its time too. Why is everyone so uptight about answering a few questions? Well, maybe we're just not cool with you setting up your own little Patriot Act, man. He's a liberal. But Lost wrote all their characters to be equally multi-dimensional and fucked up and sad and stuff. And the world they live in reflects that as well, often in a very progressive kind of way. <laughs> Said is an Islamic Iraqi soldier who fought in a direct conflict against the United States, but he's never portrayed as a villain. Like everyone else, he's simply a complicated, multi-layered character who just may be responsible for a few deaths. Said's second flashback story, he's heavily coerced by the CIA to covertly hang out with his old university roommate, Assam, who, along with his old roommates, have been operating as a small-time terrorist cell in Sydney. Saeed learns that Assam's wife died, quote, near a bomb, and that the group is planning another operation, and Assam has been chosen to be a martyr. However, Assam seems more and more morally conflicted after the death of his wife and wants out. Assam also reveals to Saeed that he was not responsible for gathering the explosives for the operation, which is what tipped off the CIA in the first place. His only purpose in the group 
is to die. When Saeed tells the CIA that Assam wants out and he could help too, they tell him that that's not an option and that Saeed should convince him to go through with the operation or else they won't let him know where Nadia is, who is actually alive under CIA observation, as it turns out. I lost someone too, Assam. I will never be whole again. Saeed convinces Assam to blow himself up but then ultimately decides to tell him the truth, revealing that he's been working with the CIA. Assam kills himself in front of Saeed in betrayal. I hope she makes you whole again. After all, Saeed, that's what you were leading him to. With no one to claim Assam's body, Saeed chooses to claim it himself to make sure he's given a proper Islamic burial, as opposed to allowing him to be cremated as a body in the system, a concern Saeed also brought up before everyone decided to turn the plane into a funeral fire. But while the Twilight Zone's episodic nature widened the range of fantasy and sci-fi elements they could play around with, Lost, despite having strong episodic qualities, is a serialized show, and that meant careful clues had to be placed along the way to let the audience know the show knew where it was going. That's where no should be. Yet that is no. And they knew where it was going, in a way. But the direction had to keep evolving. Mystery grill. Wawa bagel. Oh, I'm so hungry. Oh well, gotta finish these Scooby-Doo videos. I'm sure this habit of overworking and undereating won't catch up to me. Only been doing it for a year. Oh my God, I'd love to sign a year-long sponsorship agreement. I can't take on the workload, but uh, could you imagine? Well, who left this bagel Go here? Uh, so anyways, Ty, I'm stressed. I'm tired. I'll see you next week. I'm stressed. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm stressed. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm stressed. I'm stressed. I'm stressed. I'm stressed. Go back to work. I'm stressed. I just want to vibe. I'm gonna go get some sleep. As work on the show went underway after the pilot and it started airing, Damon Lindelof found himself increasingly stressed under the newfound pressure of running a show. JJ left, which was right after the pilot got picked up. Um, he was like, you are gonna run the show. And, and I was the CEO of what amounted to be a, you know, um, uh, you know, a $60 million a year corporation uh, with no management experience. I was a writer. Every episode had to have multiple stories, a story that was happening on the island and a story that was happening in the past relating to one of these characters. And if we could do it just right, there'd be a thematic resonance between the two. So the degree of difficulty in making an episode of Lost was very, very high. We were shooting it in Hawaii, so I was going back and forth. You know, so on Monday we would come in and there would be blank white board and then the following Wednesday we would have to deliver 55 pages of material while we were coming up with the story for the next one and editing the one before I'd that. I've never before or since had a creative experience like that one where you just are completely and totally flying by the seat of your pants and going with your gut and whatever feels right you just do. 
and in the, most of the time that results in a cataclysmic disaster. But the real backbone of the story was that all the castaways were asking Jack, what should we do? Where should we go? And he's like, I'm just the guy who like, when I came upon the plane crash started fixing people, I have doctor skills, but I do not fucking know what to do now. Uh, my first breakdown was around the time that I wrote Confidence Man, which was the sixth episode or the eighth hour of the show, which is a Sawyer flashback. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of when I hit the wall. And I feel what's cool about the show is that you take a character who you introduce as a hero, and then you show, wow, maybe they're not that really heroic of a person. And so I tried to quit the show after six episodes, and JJ said, you know, you just need help. And I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, I do, help. And he said, oh, no, no, I'm shooting Mission Impossible 3. So, like, do you know anybody who, who you think could, could come in and help you out? Um, and uh, I thought of Carlton, who was my mentor on, on Nash Bridges, and he was developing a couple things over at Sony, but he wasn't on a show, so I called him up. Saying, just kind of as a mentor figure, how, what the hell should I do? How, how should, I called him up and I said, I need a partner, and he said, send me all the scripts that you've written and any cuts that you have now, and I'll call you back. I sent them all, he read them all that night, he called back the next day and said, I'll, I'll, I'll do it if you'll have me. After production started, but before the pilot aired, Damon Lindelof's mentor, Carlton Cuse, had accepted to showrun the show alongside Damon, which was only picked up for 12 episodes initially, because despite the strong Comic-Con premiere, early signs indicated it would flop. And then when he came in, my entire world changed much more positively. I think I only tried to quit one more time. Apparently, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air's Carlton was named after Carlton Cuse. Oh. <laughs> I tried to quit to Carlton. And he was like, you just hired me. And I was like, yes, but now I have somebody to quit to. And uh, he was like, no, 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 no. Hey, let's just make the 12 best episodes of television that we can that just, that just are cool to us. And if we go down, let's go down in flames. And for us, the model was like The Prisoner or Twin Peaks, which were short-lived shows, but you know, kind of continue to this day to still be engaging and fascinating. And He's like, go and take like three days off. You, you, you'll, you'll be fine. What I told myself was, you're running a 10K and, and you can make it. Like, you'll be a cult classic. I had conversations with ABC executives. The thinking was, it's too weird, and also, the pilot's good, but what's episode two gonna be, let alone episode five? And I was like, right? Like, what, you know, do you have any ideas for episode five? <laughs> Despite the reservations of the executives, ABC pulled no stops promoting the show, airing commercials constantly and aggressively. Lost. ABC this fall. Where are we? The ratings for the for the pilot came out, and uh, I remember actually Damon coming into my office, and he was nearly in tears. There's never been a, anyone in television sadder. There's no nearly about it. <laughs> to see good ratings, he was like, "Oh my God, we have to keep fucking doing this." <laughs> As Lost aired and kept airing, it became increasingly clear that this show was a hit, a big hit, hitting record high ratings for a TV pilot. But as the show kept airing, it kept being a big fucking hit. Who is this guy? Now's the time to get lost in the best new drama on TV. Somebody died out there. An all new. Lost. Lost, inside TV's biggest cult hit since The X-Files. Uh, I got news for you, if you were alive for both of those shows, the, the march towards death does not get slower. Oh my god, Lost was on the cover of Dreamwatch magazine. What do you think? Lost, the ultimate guide, cover four of six, Saeed, the tortured soul. Pretty cool. Exclusive, the secrets to Lost. This is a TV guide. So many of these magazine articles are just sort of details about the show as if the audience watching it wasn't, you know, able to remember it all. The monster, the island, the survivors. What you don't know about the wild new drama. Despite audiences thinking the show was confusing, they were enraptured. So Disney had to bring out the big salesman. I'm on the beautiful island of Oahu in Hawaii on the set of my favorite TV show, Lost. But this isn't just a friendly visit for me. It's a fact-finding mission. What the hell is going on on this show? This is an interesting segment because it's really about selling the characters of the show. The mystery takes a back seat besides a joke about what the monster could be. Cookie? Anybody have cookie? Heh. <laughs> he plays guitar with Charlie, he barters with Sawyer, and he... He wants to fuck Kate, I guess? I wonder if I got her drunk if she... I can hear that. 
You know that, right? Oh my god. Pretend you were kidding. <laughs> no, um. don't act like you're kidding. You ever think about how this is Disney's guy? I mean, I don't like that other Jimmy so much either, but that ice cream, it owns my ass. Want good PR as a stinky talk show host? You gotta get a good ice cream. How about like Jimmy Kimmel's Yummy Kibbles or James Corden in your mouth? At the time that the, that the ratings came in, we were making episode, we were writing episode seven. A uh, side note, the pilot is not counted in the production count of the first season because it was produced before the show was picked up. So when Damon says episode seven here, he's referring to what the audience sees as episode nine, solitary. And I was like, they're gonna make me do this 15 more times. Um, and now everybody's watching. He's like, oh my God, we have to keep fucking doing this. <laughs> Then we cooked the mythology, <laughs> and that was true. We actually, we started doing it a little bit, and then it really was at that point that we, we said, okay, this, this show now does look like it's gonna go for a while. We really have to now build it for a 100 episode model as opposed to a 12 episode model. Unlike doing the 10th carbon copy of a police or legal procedural, every time we write a script, it feels like we're moving into uncharted waters. But that's the thing I think that ultimately makes the writing and storytelling feel fresh. With the show only having been extended to 25 episodes after the first 10 or so episodes were written, it's no wonder why the plot starts ramping up right after the series ninth episode, Solitary with Saeed meeting the French woman and hearing the whispers of the others. It's kind of like they were building to a climax. In the next episode, raised by another, Claire starts having vivid nightmares of being attacked in her tent and wakes up with scratches. Jack is hesitant to believe somebody is attacking her because of course he would be, giving her sleeping medication to treat her anxiety. But Hurley decides to take action because of course he would. So I had an idea. I'm out here looking for some psycho with Scott and Steve, right? And I'm realizing who the hell are Scott and Steve? I'm not following you. Look, if I was a cop and some woman got attacked, we'd canvas, right? Knock on doors, find witnesses. But we don't even have doors. Really, you're not helping me understand where Look, you're... we don't know who's living here and who's still at the beach. I mean, we didn't even know each other. In the form of creating a manifest of the survivors compared to the flight's manifest, which has a list of everyone's names. In Claire's backstory, we learned that she did not want to carry her pregnancy, but her boyfriend convinced her to keep it. You'd, you'd really want to try? Yeah. Before saying, see ya, she chooses to give it up for adoption, being told by a psychic to keep the baby, insisting actually, before suddenly changing his mind and sending her off to give the baby to a mysterious couple living in Los Angeles, which is why Claire boards the plane. Did the psychic convince her to go to the island? Who knows? Pretty spooky. Maybe he knew Claire. Whoa, that's pretty spooky. Saeed returns, warning everyone about the whispers he's heard and Russo's threat of the others. Hurley also realizes something. Ethan, who had been oh so sneakily slipped in in the episode prior, was not on the manifest. But before they can let Claire know, it's too late. Ethan confronts Charlie and Claire and then kidnaps them. Who is he? With the show continuing on, we also started getting a look into how the individual flashback narratives would progress and continue to tie into their time on the island thematically. The episode All the Best Cowboys Have Daddy Issues, which apparently was also the first episode Carlton Cuse worked on directly, despite Javier Grillo Marks Walk being the credited writer, puts Jack's obsession with saving people to the test. In an opening scene, Jack is desperately trying to resuscitate a patient on the operating table who's obviously dead. He just keeps going. His dad, who's in the surgery with him tells him to call it and pronounce the patient dead, but Jack keeps trying. You embarrassed him out there, dad, but he can't handle failure, right? They split up into groups and Ethan ambushes Jack, warning him that if he continues to follow, he'll kill one of them. They keep chasing him, but stop when they come across Charlie hanging from a tree. We finally learn what Jack did when Jack is asked by his father not to share that he had been drinking at lunch before the surgery. However, Jack blames his father's inebriation for the patient's death and decides to tell the truth, resulting in his father losing his position as the chief of surgery and his medical license. Look what you've done, Jack. At the end of the episode, mirroring the opening flashback, Jack desperately tries to resuscitate Charlie, finally giving up. No. No. Jack! 
Jack! Only to go Jack, back in and try Jack. again. He's got to save people. Despite the voice in his head telling him to call it, Charlie wakes up. But Claire is still missing. However, the other half of the search party finds something else entirely. A concrete hatch under the floor of the jungle. That seems impossible to open. The island itself is a mystery box. The Ethan storyline largely dies down for a few episodes, except for Saeed enlisting Shannon to help translate Rousseau's notes in an attempt to try to figure out where the others are. But John and Boone start trying to open the hatch, and in the episode Hearts and Minds, which features Boone and Shannon's backstory, another important plot trend begins. Is that Sawyer in Boone's flashback? Here's a huge moment in the show here. Notice who's walking through the back of the scene, Sawyer is being hauled into this police station behind Boone and um, this sort of represented a, a, sort of another major evolution in the course of the series which was the audience was seeing, oh my god, these characters have crossed paths in their lives before they came to the island and what does that mean? Before Claire returns in the 15th episode, Homecoming. <laughs> with amnesia. Who are you people? That's pretty weird. Which fun fact, Damon Lindelof considers to be his least favorite episode of the show. While all the best cowboys have daddy issues as a beautiful example of the show's dual narrative format, the episode Homecoming was an early sign of its limitations. Ethan goes to Charlie and he says, Charlie, listen, give me Claire or I'll murder someone. Oops, Steve's dead. Dude, that was Scott. Oops, Scott's dead. However, this is a miscalculation on Ethan's part because he doesn't know that they have a suitcase full of guns from the marshal. My doctor, you've been holding out on us. They start to hunt him down. In Charlie's flashback, he decides to quit drugs after drive shaft breaks up and he decides to instead sell copiers for this woman's dad. He's trying to settle down for her, but they have no chemistry, so he steals from her. Mmm, drug money. She dumps his ass. They find Ethan, and then before they can ask him any questions, Charlie shoots him. Oh, I get it. He shot Ethan because he was sad about selling copiers. Oh wait, no, no, no. He murdered Ethan because he's addicted to drugs. No, that's a fucked up line of logic. Okay, he murdered Ethan. Uh, he got me. Because he likes Claire a lot. That tracks. Ethan kidnapped Claire and he likes Claire a lot because her dad also sells copiers? Oh wait, it's because Charlie and Claire actually have chemistry and he had no chemistry with the other girl. But Ethan tried to take that from him. He, he can't go back to selling copiers. Shoot him, Charlie. Oh, again. It seemed like Ethan just needed to be killed to maintain the mystery behind the others. And the flashback storyline was more of a justification that was reverse engineered to justify that. But it doesn't land. The reveal really seems to be that Charlie has a dark side, which is just, it, it, it's not really, that's not a human emotion. <laughs> Between this episode and the episode, whatever the case may be, which we'll go into detail about more later, there was a few episodes within this Ethan story arc that seemed a bit confused. Where'd that briefcase go? Burnout, I've been over that game for years. I'm on Burnout 3, baby. Paradise. Oh my god, Billy Vibing, what do I do? Do you want water in the shot or no? Yeah, do you have a little at all? Uh, Not really. Let me do it more like this. Can you hear, how, how well can you hear the? I don't think I hear it in the headphone, it's hard. All right, we'll just try it. I have been tired and stressed for a very long time. I went to the psychiatrist and she said I had severe panic disorder. When I started working on this video, I was expecting to take a few weeks away. Severe anxiety. Just to work on something that's a bit more of quality and longer than my normal stuff, but. More than severe depression. As I kept watching the show, I was really just like enjoying it. Like, a lot. And a $70 copay. And over the past few months, I've started on medication and I have been making better life habits to make sure that hopefully one day I can be a little less tired and stressed. It's not perfect, but it's baby steps. 
I'll make stuff again, regularly. I, uh, but sometimes I'm gonna go away and I'm gonna make things that I just am making for the pure enjoyment of it. I was hoping this video, the first part of this epic series was only gonna be like an hour long, but that wasn't going to be okay because I've really found that uh, the things I could talk about in this show is really unlimited in scope. I've been thinking about Lost for a very long time, especially when it comes to talking about everybody who was involved in the show. This video project is mostly looking at Lost from a macro standpoint, really only getting into the nitty gritty of the responsibilities of those who had head writing responsibilities. But the final story of Lost as it's written only came about through a highly collaborative process. Uh, shout out to Nico who's been helping me on this whole video process. We're essentially in our third draft of this video. I've been re-recording lines and recording new lines and new green screen segments throughout the whole thing. Uh, he's been a huge champ throughout this whole thing. I was working on the next Lost video, Nico. I never learned piano. All right. I had a bunch of friends do voices for this. And my lovely girlfriend, Arizona, and our friend, Savannah, woke up at the crack of dawn to go to the beach. Hey, Billy, it's me, your great grandfather. Get back to work, you ungrateful bastard. I'm so good. And my friend, Lexi, she drew some doodles that, that are coming up. So yeah, Billy M wouldn't happen without other people than Billy M. Although there are some episodes within season one that only have an individual credited for writing, everybody in the Lost writer's room and even people on set contributed to the final story of an episode. For example, David Fury is credited for writing the episode Walkabout, but David Lindelof felt very close to establishing Jack and Kate's relationship. So he wrote many of their scenes within the episode. The show Joe has a steady stream of weird and intriguing things happening all the time and personal dramas, but it would not work if it weren't for the amazing production value the show has. I mean, these days TV has so much money pumped into it, and during the pandemic, we've all been watching $250 million blockbusters at home premiere on streaming. So Lost may seem pretty tame by today's standards. I mean, the show is just beautiful. Hawaii is a gorgeous filming location, and fortunately, the series was all shot on 35 millimeter film, so it still looks great today, uh, besides some wonky VFX shots here and there. It's really impressive with what they're able to do. Lost is able to create a universe with just a few sets and locations. And while J.J. Abrams would direct the ambitious pilot, the show itself would have loads of different directors and writers with on-set producer responsibilities who would all contribute to ultimately infuse an emotional sincerity to what was perceived by so many of those involved as hokey and silly. You are incredibly lucky to have like an amazing group of actors. They are the characters and they understand the characters. It brings more to the material than you could possibly hope and makes the bad writing good. Dad? Director Jack Bender would go on to direct the most episodes of the show, even serving as an executive producer later on. While director, while director of photography Larry Fong would establish the overall look of the show in the pilot, Bender would also establish some norms for the series, like trying to avoid blues and greens in the flashback in order to create a visual distinction from the island, as well as using more handheld shots on the island and more stationary shots in flashback. He was one of the few people who was let in on the show's long-term game plan, as it evolved, which is good because actors did not know where the show was going. Terry O'Quinn only has one or two scenes in the pilot and decided to just trust the writers. When the guy got sucked into the engine and stuff like that, that, that was pretty wild. I was pretty amazed that we were doing a television show and that that stuff was being involved in it. But at the time, I didn't know Locke's story. I didn't know then that I had been confined to a wheelchair. So they were holding everything pretty close to the vest. So when I ran over and helped, I wasn't aware that a moment ago I had been a paraplegic. In retrospect, it's much easier to remember the major turning points when thinking about Lost's story. It's easy to forget a lot of the humanity in these scenes. Even die in my obsessive note-taking of all 121 episodes, forgot that Rousseau has a broken music box and Saeed being the tech guy offers to fix it. Thank you so much. <laughs> She's so overwhelmed with joy when she sees it, but she doesn't Thank know so if much. he's a kind stranger or... 
Please let me go. If he's just trying to earn her trust to hurt her. Go. Saeed, meanwhile, is forced to balance his emotional distress over Nadia while being tortured, uneasy about Russo's mental state, genuinely concerned for her well-being and feeling sympathetic for her. Have you seen other people on this island? No. But I hear them. Might be that thing out there. The monster. There's no such thing as monsters. There's so much emotional complexity baked into these scenes, which I can imagine was a blast for the actors. When they finally got good scenes to act out, I'm sure there was a lot of sitting around too. You're on an island that is a six hour flight from the mainland and we were not letting anybody leave because the scripts were coming in with maybe four or five days of prep before an episode, but an actor would basically read a script and say like, I'm not even in this one, can I go to the mainland? No because so, we might change our mind. From the actor's point of view, there is often a frustrating spontaneity to the writing process. And from the show's first episode, there were rumors a major cast member was going to die, something the entire cast feared of on set. The death was less of a rumor, actually, and more of a direct guarantee. Someone will definitely die by the end of this season, J.J. Abrams. I mean, the show's story was always changing. In an early draft of the pilot, there's an overweight, bearded, NRA-loving character who dies when Sawyer can't lift him off a cliff. However, J.J. Abrams was watching Curb Your Enthusiasm, saw Jorge Garcia play a drug dealer, loved the role, and was delighted to see him come into audition the next day. So that character was written out, Hurley was written in, and Jorge Garcia probably never felt job security knowing the character he was written to replace originally died. And another early draft of the script, Jack is a part written specifically for Michael Keaton, who would have shockingly died in the pilot in the cockpit scene instead of the pilot who died in the pilot. It's a pretty good pilot though. Not the one who crashed the plane. But that meant not even our lead guy could feel safe. They were willing to kill off the main cast member. What I want to know is, does anyone know where this is headed or is it just being made up as you go along? No, I guarantee you somebody knows where it's headed. Yeah, okay, you keep telling yourself that. I guarantee you somebody knows where it's headed. I somebody mean, I, works on the show? He's like, you, you'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Despite this, I feel like the spontaneity in the writing process was the reason why they were able to write engaging stories in the first season. All of the stories are really just designed to allow the audience to connect with these characters who are played by awesome actors. I've heard a lot of people call Lost narratively slow, and that's not wrong at all. But when the story of the episode is good, it kind of doesn't matter because all of these top-notch performances really help to sell the emotional core of each individual episode's story. You could critique them for creating the characters as they were casting, essentially making it up as they go along, but I think the spontaneity in the writing process is ultimately what makes the first season of Lost such a great season of television. We're discovering the characters as the writers are discovering them, and be because of that, uh, the stories that are told within the first season are often really engaging. Catering the characters to the actors really allowed them to maximize their performances. I mean, Josh Holloway has a natural Southern accent, but he auditioned without it. It wasn't until they were on set filming the pilot that J.J. Abrams told him to not hold back and to use his normal voice. And then his Southern origin was retroactively written into the character's origin. Which is great because I can't imagine Sawyer without his stupid Southern charm, y'all. I'm being tortured, uh, and I deserve it. <laughs> The performances elevate the stories and the characters in ways that I'm unable to describe with words. It's so frustrating editing these videos because I don't want to cut the actors off. I want to let their performances play out completely because I truthfully believe Lost, it Lost's plot as it's described without describing, uh, you know, the performances and how it intercuts with the flashback story sounds incredibly lame. People need his help. There's no water, but he sees somebody in a suit. It's his dad. His dad's dead, but he's on the island and the casket is empty. But he found water. 
No, what makes that episode great are its emotional cores, scenes that don't necessarily contribute to the plot. You know, Jack sitting down crying at the fire. The eerie rendition of Michael Giacchino's life and death as Jack walks into the cave. All the subplots of the things breaking down at the beach. Everything is used to create an emotional backbone for all this sci-fi hullabaloo. This show could have easily not worked without the right casting, especially because all of the characters have a moral ambiguity to them. You have murderers, murderers, murderers. It doesn't hurt that all the characters are also like stupid attractive, the sexy get away with so much. I was shocked at how much fan service there was, like all the time in the show. Like sure, they're on a deserted island, it's hot, they're not gonna be wearing heavy gear sweating all the time, but the, the, they're also just like in their underwear all the time. So many shots are just ogling their sweaty, sexy, dirty bodies. No other show on network TV allowed their actors to get down and dirty like this. Have they, have they gone mudding recently? Okay, bees, better take off our shirts. What I love about this scene is right after they find some like, you know, deep lore, they find some bodies inside the cave with Jack thinks are hundreds of years old or 50 years old. It's like, better get our actors naked before we give them lore. They're muddy, they haven't slept in days and they're... Ah, Kate pinned Sawyer down. She thinks he stole the water. Oh no, Sawyer's pinning Kate down. How far will this go? Oh, Saeed stops both of them. You can criticize anime for being super horny, but what's worse, an artist cramping their hand drawing the biggest of anime titties or embarrassing your actors by having them pose half naked in front of dozens and dozens of cast and crew and then like millions and millions of people around the world. I mean, sure, they both serve the purpose of grabbing your attention and, and yeah, I admit, as a kid, I thought Kate was stupid attractive. But no one is stupider or more attractive than Sawyer. I mean, Josh Holloway, he's just become known as network TV's handsome man. He was cast in the Community episode exactly because he's that, a network TV handsome man. You could squeeze out your stress on that chin. Early on, Sawyer tries to be the tough guy by shooting the marshal. But I think this is when we see who Sawyer actually is because when Jack tells him that he missed his heart and hit his lung, and now that he's going to suffocate, Sawyer's cold-hearted facade totally shatters. Jack tells him to leave and he can't even hold himself from shaking long enough to light a cigarette as Jack suffocates him inside. Sawyer is easily the most combative character in the first season, always putting on the facade of the tough loner. Sawyer finds Boone looking through his secret stash and beats him up a whole lot. Boone explains to everyone that he was looking for Shannon's inhaler. He suspects Sawyer has it because he saw Sawyer reading a book that was in Shannon's carry-on bag. Kate tries to communicate with Sawyer and he's like, I ain't a good guy, Freckles. He shows her the mysterious letter he's been reading. Sawyer reads a lot of books. That must be a pretty good letter. It's addressed to Sawyer from a kid named James, who explains that after Sawyer pulled a con on his mother, which lost the family money, his father murdered her and then himself in a fit of rage. All while the kid, James watched under the bed. Once Shannon starts having a bad asthma attack, the immediate desperation leads Saeed to brush off those old torturing skills. Good morning. It doesn't have to be this way. Yeah, it does. But no matter what Saeed does, Sawyer won't talk. That's all you got. Sawyer finally relents, saying he'll tell them where the inhaler is if he can get a smooch from Kate. Happy to tell you. As soon as I get that kiss. What? Are you serious? Just not seeing the big picture here, Freckles. You really gonna let that girl suffocate? You can't bring yourself to give me one little kiss. Kate reluctantly, but then passionately, gives Sawyer that kiss. But then Sawyer reveals he has no idea where the inhaler was. He was just being complicated, I guess. He just allowed himself to be tortured by Saeed to bring him down to his level, I guess, or as a form of self-harm, I guess, or as some insane macho man test, I guess. So you got Sir, maybe to smooch Kate. I guess. Who knows? He's the complicated con man. In Sawyer's first flashback, we find out he's a con man. He plans to rip off a married wealthy couple by playing it smooth with the dude's wife, conning the husband, and then taking all their money. 
Sawyer is the perfect character to swindle housewives, a smooth-talking, manipulative <laughs> empath. He really knows how to play people. You weren't exactly supposed to see that. And the people writing the show really know their audience. Hello. And my sister says hi to Josh because you're her favorite. And um, my question yeah, he's is... he's my mom's favorite. <laughs> I think he's every mom's one favorite. Us, one of us is going to die this year. She goes, not Sawyer! <laughs> <laughs> After torturing him the whole episode, Saeed stabs Sawyer in the arm, unable to believe that he really doesn't know where the inhaler is. Saeed accidentally hits Sawyer's artery and in shame runs back to the camp. Jack quickly works to save Sawyer's life, but Sawyer hates that Jack has to help him. Something you should know. Table to turn. You die. Just this little emo boy, this one. However, at the end of the flashback story, he's about to walk away with this couple's money, with the wife believing she's going to meet up with him and run away from her husband, and the husband thinking he's about to make a big return on investment. But when a kid walks into the room, Sawyer, in fact, does not go through with the con, backing out and leaving urgently. You're not walking out of here. You know what I had to do for this? All this money in one day? Take your hand off me, boy. Sawyer has been perceived as the bad guy the whole time, and it turns out he wants people to see him that way. Kate realizes the letter Sawyer gave her is too old to have been written to Sawyer. She realizes Sawyer must have been the one to write it. He's not the evil Sawyer. He's the scared little kid James. He's playing a part. And when she starts to sympathize with him, he yells at her to leave, not wanting someone to feel sorry for him. Get out! But fucking shit, he feels sorry for himself. You could also introduce a character who is supposedly a villain and then say, well, actually, this person is not that much of a villain. You know, how did they get that way? Because I think, like, all of our characters are sort of emotional beings who we want to understand why they are the way they are. And so I wanted to explain what Sawyer's origin was. What is that letter that he's reading in the pilot? Why does it motivate him to go out and send out this broadcast. Why does he want people to hate him so much? Well, I obviously think the backstories are important for understanding the series lore and the characters as the story goes on. I don't think that's what makes these early seasons great. What I think makes these early seasons great are these stories are really just written to allow these actors to exhibit a wide range of emotions backed by the flashback storylines. It, it allows for complexity in the emotional range. It's all harmonious, and believe me, we will talk about the music. Our more complete image of Sawyer as a character comes together as he yells at Kate to get out. It, it's a whimper. Get out! Like an upset little kid yelling at his mom to leave his room. He's like Matt from Digimon for like housewives, <laughs> you know, he, he's like emo, but with a country twang. A lone wolf. A lone coyote. Side note, this is also when we find out Sun has a garden growing eucalyptus to help relieve Shannon's asthma symptoms, which, uh, fun fact, eucalyptus could actually make them much worse in real life. With actors being kept in the dark about where the characters are going, some actors like Daniel Day Kim and Yoon Jin Kim actually expressed concerns to the producers and publicly about their characters leaning into stereotypes. In an interview given before the pilot aired, both Day Kim and Yoon Jin Kim explained of feeling a pressure of portraying these characters on American network television because it generally lacked Korean representation. There's a concern that Sun was leaning into stereotypes that Asian women were submissive and that the angry and unfriendly Jin was just not a positive representation to begin with. Jin is just not a likable guy in the first season through and through. I mean, he's the, no, I know our plane just crashed, but it's raining and you're, you're gonna be out in the wet guy. However, before the pilot aired, both actors stated that they had extensive conversations with J.J. Abrams and Damon Lindelof about cultural representation within the show, and they both expressed confidence that both characters would eventually be revealed to be multi-dimensional, multi-faceted people. Daniel Day Kim went as far as to say that more so than any other role he has, he feels like he is interwoven into the fabric of Lost. With so many characters in Lost being about revealing dimensions and sides to character archetypes you wouldn't expect, it often uses its diverse casting to challenge the expectations they expected their presumed-to-be-American conservative audience to have. 
For example, Michael is a black father who had not been in his son's life, but eventually it's revealed he tried for years to change that and had to be basically strong-armed into giving up custody of Walt to his uh, previous girlfriend, uh, Walt's mom. I particularly love Jin and Son's flashback. I actually think it's the, one of the best examples of how the flashback narratives can continue to develop after their introduction. This particular story would have only been possible after the series had been extended. We first see Son's flashback in episode 6, House of the Rising Sun, and it wouldn't be until months later in episode 17 that we would see Jin's flashback in the episode in translation, which tells the same events parallel to Sun's flashback. He's purposefully distant with the others and really encourages Sun to be the same way in a very toxic way, even accusing her of having a different kind of relationship with Michael. Despite the language barrier, it's clear to everyone that Jin is very controlling of Sun, telling her to cover up and put on warmer clothing so it will conceal her more, rather than wearing clothing that will be comfortable on this island. This all comes to a boil when seemingly out of nowhere, Jin just starts attacking Michael in the surf. Sun screams at him to stop in horror. Everyone decides to grab Jin and put him in handcuffs, leaving both of them unable to describe the situation. Jin was once a sweet man whose son fell in love with. She wanted to elope with him, but he wanted to get her father's permission to be with her. Proper man in society or whatever. Jin is able to provide for Sun, giving her gifts. However, the sweet man she once knew has begun gun to disappear as he started to work as a hired thug for her father. He now comes home angry and agitated with blood all over his hands. He can't even look at her. It's revealed that Sun learns English as a part of a plan to leave him while they're on a business trip in the United States. But during their layover in Sydney, he's different. For a moment, that sweet and innocent man she once knew shines through. Perhaps it's not too late for them after all. Sun reveals to Michael she can speak English to explain to him why Jin was mad. Your husband tried to murder me for a watch? I found this watch two days ago. It belongs to my father. Protecting that watch is a question of honor. You call trying to kill me in front of my kid honor. You don't know my father. He gives it back to Jin while giving him a stern talking to and cuts the handcuffs for him. But the tension between the two remains at a simmer. I think today with K-pop and K-dramas like Squid Game and Korean cinema making such big splashes internationally, it may be hard to see how bold it was to have subtitled scenes with Korean speaking actors on network TV, where you could be canceled the second your ratings start to slip. American audiences typically really fucking hate subtitles. Case in point, this dude. Power, who's got the uh, microphone? Does that work? To stand up? You guys are like fucking rock stars. I like how you say fuck without the censorship. Yeah. This is great. I like it. I'm liking it. All right, strange tactic to flaunt your virginity in front of everybody before making whatever point it is you're about to make. Uh, so let's go ahead. Let's hear what you have to say, Mr. Virgin. I have a question about your Jin and Jin's wife episode. Uh, wh what? <laughs> he just said it again. I haven't had sex. Uh, I always wondered this because how come you have them speak in Korean and not English? I feel like I'm watching a foreign film and it's kind of frustrating and I don't know what the heck they're saying. <laughs> okay, so this guy just stood up, confirmed to everyone he was a virgin for some reason, went on a racist rant because he can't read before finally not taking his opportunity to say fuck. And I don't know what the heck they're saying. Also, just a side note, Zachary Levi is hosting this panel. Look at him. When Jin and Sun are speaking to each other, they're subtitled, but when they're around the others, the subtitles are avoided to make the audience feel the disconnect. It's funny to note that while Yoon Jin Kim, who plays Sun, was already a pretty big star in South Korea, starring in movies and television, Daniel Day Kim only spoke Korean as a young child and had to be coached on set. He apparently spent a lot of time in the ADR booth re-recording and re-recording lines being critical of his pronunciation, treating this role with the utmost care. They'll replay the line in, in playback and he'll be like, oh no, I'll do that one again too. <laughs> <laughs> like, any, everyone who's like do, working in the sound studio is like going, he's like, no, 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 I kind of kind of slurred it. But. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm usually next in line going, come on. I only do that to make you wait. <laughs> <laughs> However, that's not the only effort that was made. Both actors were part of long conversations and gave input on set to help bring an authenticity to many of the details surrounding their characters. Um, there are a couple things like little details, again, not the whole structure, but like the name Sun Jin, that's a half a name. 
so we kind of addressed it in in um, in translation the last episode of Daniel's or Korean food how it's set the table um, if it's not set right as far as like which food would be the most elaborate thing that son prepares for Jin I kind of picked out that dish <laughs> um, stuff like that yeah and and again the writer the writers and the producers are so open about taking in your own your ideas so it's it feels good to be part of it however whatever that original plan was with Jin is probably not what ended up happening because in a recent interview with Vulture magazine Daniel Day Kim revealed that Jin was actually supposed to be killed off in the first season no one felt safe I, I swear to God everyone thought they were gonna die on this show it's only because staff writer Monica Macer who's black and Korean herself had lobbied heavily for the character's potential beyond death that the character became what it became. Which brings us to the show's 17th episode in translation. Get it? Like the movie. Loosened in translation. It tells Jin's perspective parallel to Sun's original story. We see that Jin works for Sun's father, a ruthless businessman in the automotive industry because he wants his approval to be with Sun and feels the need to do whatever it takes because Sun's father looks down on Jin for being from a working class family. When sent to intimidate a government employee who's been passing environmental regulations, Jin's initial instinct to quote, deliver a message is to be polite and kind about it. The man's grateful reaction explains where Jin got the puppy he gave Sun in the earlier episode. It's only later, after he's coerced by Sun's father, does Jin go and beat the man in front of his family. But even then, he only does it so another guy doesn't shoot him. He wanted to save his life. We see him wash the blood off of his hands again, but instead of seeming angry and agitated like he did before, he seems ashamed of what he's done. We then learn that Jin had lied to Sun about his father being dead. He's ashamed of being the child of a fisherman. Jin and his father reconnect at the end of the episode episode with him being revealed to be the sweetest and most forgiving man alive. Like fuck, look at that smile. An unforgettable role in just one scene. I am literally sitting here grinning ear to ear because of how infectious the kindness of this character and performance is. Jin acknowledges he's become someone he hates and that he's ruined his and son's marriage, but he doesn't want to leave because he fears for his and son's life. Jin's father encourages him to use an upcoming business trip to America to run away with son and start all over again, risk everything for love. He decides to go forward with it, completely shattering our view of a character who, despite having a few nice scenes before, was largely unlikable. I think the idea that you cannot understand what Jin and son are saying is is a way of highlighting their otherness on the show and it allows people and the other characters to project what they think is going on with them when they may not really know. After somebody burns the raft and people start blaming Jin, Sun has no choice but to reveal to everyone, including Jin, she knows English. Leave him alone! Jin stops speaking to her and starts working on the raft with Michael and Sawyer. And even though Sun is devastated that Jin seems to be leaving her, she also feels a new sense of freedom. Wow, what meaningful fan service. What will become of their relationship? But going back to the production side of things, the show's sound design is so interesting. And we can't talk about production or performances without talking about the best performer in the whole show, the guy you never see, Michael Giacchino, who scored all six seasons. The soundscape of Lost reminds me a lot of the Twilight Zone. The airplane sound effects that transition to flashbacks, the drumbeat at the end of the cliffhanger for every single act, the loud horns, and of course, the final drumbeat at the end of the show and the end credits, which just make you feel like you keep going down and down the rabbit hole. I mean, the Labrador hole. There's so many recognizable melodies throughout the show that help the audience connect emotional threads between scenes. Giacchino, of course, has gone on to do many recognizable Pixar scores, but I also find it very fitting that he went on to replace John Williams' role in both Jurassic World and Star Wars Rogue One. He has a very John Williams kind of feel to him, except Lost has a much smaller band than those movies, so a lot of the individual instruments are able to convey a lot more personality. Some element that is comfortable, something that represents home to these people, but surrounded completely by this very esoteric, weird, strange, uncomfortable 
sound. The strings and the occasional piano carry so much emotional weight. That scene where Sun's just watching Jin in the airport and she's crying because she thinks she's going to leave him and then he pulls up the flower and her look and how just the emotion of the scene completely shifts. Oh. Between the sound design and the score, a lot of extra steps were taken to give Lost a unique sound. From playing instruments in unconventional ways to finding instruments that are made from unconventional materials. And the first thought was like, okay, they're on in a, in a jungle, so jungle. But it was like, no, nah, we don't want jungle percussion. We want stuff that's like bizarre. So what we did was we shipped home sections of the airplane uh, and in the percussion booth. The guy plays the airplane pieces. We have an instrument called the anklong, which is normally a wooden instrument, but we have one that uh, is made of metal. That has a very unique sound to it. And just banging on all kinds of weird, just different things. And the idea is to use these kind of conventional instruments in ways that you don't normally use these instruments. It's been so hard for me to cut clips for this video between the performances and the music. I just want to let it play out. I want you to hear some of this shit. But just trust me, Michael Giacchino takes these emotional scenes to the next level. The brass knuckles on an emotional gut punch. Alright, I'm ready. Go. <laughs> so some people will comment, they'll say, Hey Billy, I noticed you're drinking a lot on camera. Are you an alcoholic? I am literally going to the store right now because I do not keep alcohol in my house and I have to go buy it in order to drink it on camera. As for why I'm drinking it on camera, uh, truth be told, I just think I can't like express how I feel about this show in certain aspects without being totally intoxicated. <laughs> yeah, I don't drink a lot, but I do smoke a fuck ton of weed. The mysterious nature of the island is such a great hook for the series, but I honestly believe that's what it is. It's a hook. Slowly, more and more of this mysterious place is revealed as the characters discover more about it, piece by piece, like levels in a video game. The island could, in a way, be a dramatic version of a video game. You could find the hatch, but it could take you several weeks before you had the proper tools to open the hatch. It's not even until Saeed steals the map from Rousseau that we get a full image of the island and it's just a pencil sketched outline. None of the details are really filled in except for mountains. Some of the mysteries in Lost are so straightforward. Like, okay, there's a monster, what is it? There's some polar bears. Why are they on a tropical island? But I don't think I'm doing justice to the other conspiracy level threads. This show weaves in like all the time. Let's talk about one scene. So Russo takes Saeed captive and she mentions a mysterious name, her child. Alex, where is she? She mentions a mysterious place, the Black Rock. Oh, where is it? She mentions the mysterious others who are like the biggest mystery for the first two seasons. Where are they? She mentions the sickness that all the other scientists had. What was that? And then also just to slip in a little bit of extra mystery, she mentions that her radio broadcast isn't coming from the location where she brought Saeed, but in Instead, another a mysterious unknown location. That's just one fucking scene. They're just like little mysterious details being weaved in all the time. Like after Jack and Kate get naked because they're attacked by bees, they find two bodies in the cave and Jack suspects they're very old. They have like a white and black rock in them. What's up with that? Two players, two sides. One is light, one is dark. It's challenging keeping the mythology elements alive without having them become overbearing or too frustrating for the audience. We try to feed out some answers to some of those things. It's just that combination is something which we work really hard at trying to find the right balance at. As season one continues, the audience will get a chance to see Hurley's backstory, ooh. And then, 
there's the numbers. In the episode 18, in episode 18 numbers, we learned Hurley had won the lottery with a set of numbers. 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, and 42. Now he's worth $150 million. Wow. But afterwards, he suffers from like a string of bad luck. He buys his mom a nice house and she breaks her ankle after uh, getting out of the car. His favorite chicken place burns down. Apparently, he killed some people accidentally. Uh, and some other stuff happens. Uh, his, grandpa his grandpa dies. <laughs> so after suffering from this bad luck, he goes back to the mental health facility where he was treated at, where he first heard the numbers. And he asks his old gamer friend, what's up with those numbers you're always repeating? You use those numbers to play the lottery? You've opened the box. I what? Uh, you shouldn't have used our numbers. Why not? It doesn't stop. You gotta get away from those numbers. That's that's not good, he says. Leonard tells Hurley he heard the numbers in a broadcast near Australia, which is why Hurley goes to Australia. He's gotta find out what the numbers are. What's up with these numbers? The numbers aren't just the lottery numbers. They appear everywhere within the series. John was paralyzed for four years. The plane is oceanic, 815. They find the pilot 16 hours after they ca crashed. Kate has a $23 million bounty on, $23,000 bounty on her head. That's a high bounty. <laughs> and Boone fucking dies on day 42. So get ready for that, all of you Ian Summerhalder fans out there but he's living still in real life. So, you know. Get ready, folks. <laughs> There's too many instances of the numbers happening within the series to count. Like every single number has its own entry on the Lost Wiki. And you thought, you thought us Lost fans would miss that slippery little four, Leonard, you gamer. However, when Hurley goes after Rousseau, I think we get some insight into the kind of solvencies that many of these mysteries would have. When Hurley sees the very same numbers written in Rousseau's notes, he figures maybe she knows something about them. Despite everyone's warning, he's insistent he needs to go to Russo to talk to her. Which results in an incidental adventure as everyone tries to talk Hurley into stopping this weird expedition. The survivors on this island are searching for answers, but they'll be lucky to stay alive. Charlie! Jack! Oh. But he needs to figure out what the numbers are. So Hurley, he's suffering from a string of bad luck. You know, his grandfather burns down, his new house dies, his Hummer, his brand new Hummer, it breaks its ankle. And Rousseau confronts Hurley and she's a little scared of him because she's, you know, she's a little apprehensive because of the others. But when he explains everything that he thinks the numbers are cursed, instead of calling him crazy like Jack does and like his mom did, she explains everything bad that happened to her and her team after she followed the radio signal to the island where the numbers were being broadcasted in the first place. The cursed the numbers are what brought me here. As it appears, they brought you. She says, Harley, you know what? I think you're right. These numbers, they, they are cursed. So yes, I suppose you're right. Yuckers. You know, he feels validated for the first time in years, and we get an emotional catharsis. They hug it out. You have no idea how long I've been waiting for someone to agree with me. Thank you. Oh, God, thank you. Like, thank Hurley, you. the most friendly character, and Rousseau, the most loner character on the show. She's more of a loner than Sawyer. Charlie's ready for Hurley to share some info about himself. After all, Charlie has spilled his soul to Hurley, and now he's gone on this adventure. Hurley, it's time to share something about yourself with Charlie. So Hurley tries to open up and tells him that he won the lottery, and Charlie just doesn't believe him. Back home. I'm worth $156 million. Fine, don't tell me. Dude, I bear my soul, and all I get is bloody jokes. It's always a character you least expect who's able to break through emotionally to one of the other characters. 
It's all about waiting for the right moments in time where the right characters are able to connect with each other. While the island does provide an interesting setting to explore for the audience to come back week to week, ultimately, the most important serialized element to Lost within its first season especially are the developing relationships throughout the season. And although there are no mystery cocoons growing out of alien fog, it goes back to that idea in the original Pitch Bible that the most important development in the show would be the relationships. A major highlight of the first season has nothing to do with the overarching mystery. Oh, no. It's when Harley builds a golf course during the episode Solitary. The first and hopefully last island open. What? You built a golf course? Rich idiots fly to tropical islands all the time to whack balls around. All the stuff we gotta deal with, man. This is what you've been wasting your time on? Finding an incomplete set of golf clubs and using it to get everyone's mind off of the heavy stuff that's happening. Dudes, listen, our lives suck. Everyone's nerves are stretched to the max. I mean, we're lost on an island. It's gonna be your call. Okay. Give me a seven iron. Got it. It allows everyone to unwind That's and really have there. fun for the first time since they crashed. No, John. Don't blow it. You won't get anywhere near us. And it's hard not to get a big stupid smile when Kate's able to encourage Sawyer to come to the golf course and actually try to get along with everyone. I don't have any cash, but I'll bet my dinner on the dock. Oh. I got two tubes of sunscreen, a flashlight says he chokes. Like the fucking sappy music. Dang, he, he's really he's really trying, this Sawyer. This is like right after he said, I want you to die. So it's like, wow, progress. With many of the stories on the beach camp, there's a very cozy set type feeling between the caves, the new camp they moved down to on the beach, and the few jungle locations that are supposed to be right around their camp. They laugh with each other, they hang out, and even the most bitter of rivalries can be portrayed with some friendly banter. It feels good to watch these characters learn to support one another with even the most contentious of the group coming together, like less magnanimous man than I. I'd just be thinking he could beat the ever-living snot out of you right now without fear of reprisal. You want a shot? Take it. Sawyer seems upset to hear Saeed has returned after running into Rousseau for the first time. Characters discussing past events would often serve as in-show recaps for the audience, but when it's done well, this kind of exposition blends really well into everything else. Sawyer is always a great choice to have these conversations. He's just so practical about everything, which is such a great contrast to the absurdity of everything. And why am I getting the evening news from a six-year-old? I'm 10. Okay. Then it must be true. Previously on Lost. I was taken prisoner by the French woman. One has been sending out a distress signal for 16 years. She's alive. She was on a science expedition. She said they shipwrecked. And these others, who the hell I are don't they? know. I heard something in the jungle surrounding me. Something like what? It seems like it's going to be a contentious confrontation with Sawyer grilling Saeed with questions about his time with Rousseau. But at the end of the conversation, Sawyer lets Saeed know that he has kept the signal fire going, which was Saeed's self-appointed job, just in case he decided to come back. Of course, Saeed is ashamed of what he's done, but Sawyer is acknowledging his responsibility of bringing him to that place to begin with. Rose is a character who, in the first season, kind of only exists as an ensemble member. She's really the only one who's not a series regular as well, just sort of coming in and out of the show when there's a story for her to be involved in, like when Charlie is mourning Claire going missing and in shock from nearly dying. She sits with him, tells him it's okay to mourn, but also to have faith that Claire is okay, something which she's been doing all season with her husband who is in the back of the plane. People think she's in denial, but she's so absolutely certain about it. Her husband is alive. My husband is not dead. Rose. He was in the tail section of the plane. It broke off in mid-flight. I'm sorry, but everyone who was in the rear of the plane is gone. They're probably thinking the same thing about us. 
So maybe Charlie should try to have faith too. It's a nice moment, but I, I, I don't like how Rose is like, toughen up, Charlie. Like, come on. With these strongly written and performed characters, the thing that ultimately makes the show worth watching initially isn't the overarching mystery at all. It's the connections all of these characters develop with each other through the course of the show. Each episode only lasts a couple of days or so max, meaning we really get a day-to-day -day development of their time on the island. This is where Lost having a very slow to develop plot has its strengths. The relationships that grow over the course of the season are, are such a great part to Lost. It's what makes the show good. I was a military communications officer. Oh yeah? You ever see battle? I fought in the Gulf War. No way. I got a buddy fought over there. It's totally, I think the scene is really what the show ended up being about, which was two people are strangers, they're friends, they get along, they have a nice conversation, and then it turns and they suddenly realize uh, we would never ever be friends in any other series of circumstances. Are you Air Force, Army? The Republican God. And he just owns it there. It's like, that's what I, I, love I am. His, I love Jorge, you're like, ooh. Because so much emphasis is put on developing these relationships between all of the characters, we really understand how they interact and feel about one another. And it becomes exciting to see how their relationships develop. Charlie and Claire become sort of a cute couple. Uh, Charlie asks Claire, who's pregnant, if there's anything he can do for her. And she's like, I love peanut butter. I can get you peanut butter. Yeah. Sure you can. Yes, I can. And so, like, you know, he can't find any peanut butter for her because they're uh, stuck on a deserted island. No 7-Eleven here. And when I get you peanut butter, you have to vacate this sandy shore of depression and move to the caves. <laughs> Deal? And so he finds an empty jar and he's like, oi, I found peanut butter. And like, what, eating the pretended peanut butter? She laughs, she finds it very charming. And it's like kind of like a weird, sweet moment for the two that makes me like them. Boone and John are spending all of their time trying to open the hatch. They're like father and son. Boone is like, I can help. Absolutely, we're counting on you, Boone. And John's like, I'm proud of you. And Boone's like, Absolutely, we're counting on you, Boone. This is your moment, Boone. Don't let John know you're holding back 22 gallons of tears. Oh, you got distracted and you let Scott die. Charlie and Hurley become very fast friends. Jin and Son's relationship have its up and downs throughout the season and Jin continues to connect with people more and more. There's a lot of feel good fuzzy moments with the characters like Hurley wanting Jin to teach him to catch fish. In this moment, he gets stung by a jellyfish and is trying to tell Jin he has to pee on it. Pee, pee on it. Pee on my foot, I'll lose. Just do it, I'll lose my foot if you don't. Just pee. Pee on it. No. Pee on it. No. Jin initially wants nothing to do with Hurley, but then at the end of the episode, he catches and cleans a fish for him. This is it. Oh, I get it. This is some kind of payback because I wouldn't eat the urchin the other time. No way, no. You will learn respect, and suffering will be your teacher. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> redeemed yourself, my son. Going back to Michael and Walt, despite these characters not having a flashback until after the midway point of the season, we hear a bit of their backstory. What'd you do to him? What did I do to him? You tell me. I've been with you since we crashed. Have you seen me do anything to anyone? What kind of man do you think I am anyway? What did your mother say about me? Walt did not grow up with Michael in his life, and it's only because his mom has recently died that Michael and him have been reunited. You don't know anything about me, do you? You don't know anything about me. I know a lot about you. Yeah? Yeah. When's my birthday? August 24th. When's mine? Forget it. Come on, man. Michael and Walt have their ups and downs throughout the season, and Walt clearly clicks with the other survivors more quickly, but he and Michael never seem to be able to get closer than an arm's length reach. But there are nice moments with them sprinkled throughout, like when Walt's impressed with Michael building this water system in the caves. Walt begins to connect with Locke before he connects with Michael, but Michael does not love that because Locke is a sketchy guy. You either have very good aim or very bad aim, Mr. Locke. 
his name is Locke. But of course he helps him find Vincent all the way back in Tabula Rasa, so how bad of a guy could he be? Oh no, don't worry about it, they won't mind. You want to take a swing? Hey, Michael, it's your shot. You're up. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, so we'll play later. Michael's too busy playing golf and John's like, hey kid, you want a knife? Can you teach me how to do that? how small he is. Oh my god. This is a knife. Ooh, down I go. Locke also starts to recognize something unique about Walt. Like maybe he's sniffing out those weird powers he has or something. John thinks Michael should let Walt discover his potential because he's special and different. But this, for some reason, makes Michael freak out. Michael yells at Walt, telling him he can't hang out with John anymore. And in a fit of rage, he takes his comic book, his only source of entertainment, and burns it. Oh, a polar bear. Walt's thinking about the polar bear. Wonder if a polar bear is gonna show up. So, some weird powers or something. We pick up a little bit of their backstory before we see their flashback story, but the story itself helps us to fully comprehend the huge empty chasm between them. Michael and Walt's mom go from a happy couple to naturally drifting apart as Walt's mom got career opportunities abroad. At one of the most pivotal moments in determining Walt's future, Michael got into a car accident and had to take a leave of absence from work. Walt's mom took that as an opportunity to get Michael to agree to let Walt leave the country with her, but he continues to write to him, showing off those artist skills, probably from his construction slash architectural background. He doesn't know what to write to Walt. He's only able to draw this image of himself, broken. But a nurse comes along to give him a joke suggestion. What's black, white, and red all over? Yeah, newspaper, right? A penguin with a sunburn. That's really tough. <laughs> Walt's adoptive stepfather wants nothing to do with him after the passing of his mother. Is it dead? Yeah being creeped out by his weird powers. So he brings Michael back into Walt's life to get rid of him. I didn't want to be a father, all right? I just don't know how. Hey, what the hell are you talking about, man? You adopted him. Yes, yes, I did, because she wanted that and I wanted her. And Brian, Walt's adoptive stepfather, explains the weird things that happen around Walt, like how he makes things happen. Sometimes when he's around, things happen. He's got some like weird powers or something. And Michael, thinking more practically, doesn't think it would be a good idea for Walt to lose his only father figure. But Brian says he didn't sign up for this shit and tells Michael to come get his son. Michael doesn't want to accept Walt as special or different in any way because Brian sees it as a flaw and maybe Michael does too. This is a stand-in for so many things that can make someone give up on parenting very selfishly, you know, and he physical or mental disability or disease. It's just like Walt's powers are spookier. But John accepts Walt for who he is, and maybe Michael is having trouble himself. God, I just fucking love this show. Michael and Walt get into a fight. Michael overreacts in a way that really hurts Walt. He destroys his only source of entertainment. But when Walt goes missing, John and Michael team up to rescue him from a polar bear. And now because he's been taken by a polar bear, he can't apologize. He has to prove how much he cares for him by saving him with John, who he hates. But it's a good challenge for Michael because Michael has already been established to not be an adventurer. So this whole elaborate setup with Michael having to, you know, balance on this branch to save Walt from a polar bear is a great physical obstacle for him to overcome come. The little wooden box is revealed to be a collection of hand-drawn letters Michael made for Walt, which were kept from him by his mother. Why didn't she give them to me? I don't know. But she didn't throw them away either, which means, you know, somewhere inside she wanted you to have them. So, you drew these? Just for you. This one did for your second birthday. A penguin with the sunburn? That's dumb. Yeah, I know. That's what I said. 
<laughs> I love Walt's reaction. It's so blunt, which gives an honesty to this nice moment when these two begin to bond. With Walt and Michael's relationship turning a corner, Michael is motivated more than ever to get off the island and begins building a raft. The promise that somebody would die and that people would be getting off the island, Lost literally became a dramatized version of Survivor, with so much of the conversation around the show reflecting those two things. Co-creator J.J. Abrams has said one character will be killed off this season. Do you know who it is? Yes. Yeah, I guess they would have filmed it by then. <laughs> However, the most important relationship of the show and possibly the most important aspect of the entire show uh, is the love triangle between Jack, Kate, and Sawyer. If you're watching the show as a viewer and you weren't on the show, who would you be reading for Kate to get with, Sawyer or Jack? Sawyer, right behind you, jackass. Jack and Sawyer have this really petty rivalry that continues to persist throughout the entirety of the show. I wish I shared your faith. I was mind sharing a few things with her myself. What do you want, Sawyer? Her to dock here is vacating the premises. I'll best lay claims to my new digs before somebody else did. I can fix this place up real good. Might even find somebody to share it with me. I'll talk to you later. Kate has reasons why she likes and doesn't like both of them. Jack sort of represents what she could be. She idolizes him wrongfully as the big hero of the pilot, a guy who's really got his shit together. Jack doesn't have his shit together. It's just that you and your tattoos don't add up. Jack and Kate have a really intense first encounter. The audience wouldn't know it yet, but Kate has just loosened her handcuffs. She's in shock. They both are. But Jack still has something to take care of. This huge wound. Youch. This, look, I do it myself. I'm a doctor, but I just can't you reach you. You to sew that up. It's just like the drape, same no, thing. No, with the trips, it's a sewing machine. No, you can do this, I'm telling you. If you wouldn't mind. He asks her to sew it, but she's scared. But he walks her through it, sharing an intense memory of when he accidentally almost killed a patient. He was terrified, but he had no choice but to breathe, count to five, swallow his fear, and fix the mistake he made. He cries. It's a really intense monologue written and performed with a lot of sensitivity. It allows us to see Jack how Kate sees him before learning much about him as an ambivalent, sensitive hero. Kate's first encounter with Sawyer, on the other hand, is creepy, but just as intense. Sawyer has just shot the bear and Kate has stolen the marshal's gun back from him. She pretends not to know how to take it apart and gives Saeed one piece and Sawyer the other. He sees through her act and pulls her in closely, trying to reassert his control of the situation. Yeah, I'm a girl's like you. I'm a girl's exactly like me. But Kay and Sawyer, they're both outsiders, but for different reasons. Kate wants to make connections with people, but she's always afraid people are going to find out who she really is, that she's killed people. And Sawyer is sort of the same, but he doesn't realize that he wants to make connections. So he's always self-sabotaging because he thinks, why wouldn't people hate me? I'm gonna make them hate me. Like in the episode of The Moth, Kate, Saeed, and Shannon go off to try to triangulate a stronger radio signal to get it off the island. Jack, he's trapped in the caves and Charlie goes in to save him. So Sawyer goes out to let everybody know that Jack is trapped and everyone needs help. However, Kate says something that makes Sawyer mad. What the hell are you doing here? Easy. I just came to tell you something. What makes you think I'm interested in anything you have to say? Then he chooses to keep the information from her until much later. What is it about it makes you all weak in the loins? Try to be a pig or it just comes naturally. So he's a doctor, right? Yeah, ladies dig the doctors. Even though, you know, Jack could die. You're actually comparing yourself to Jack. The difference between us ain't that big, sweetheart. I guarantee you if he had survived a few more weeks on this island, you would have figured that out. This back and forth where Kate wants to get closer and closer to Sawyer, but each time she does, she's burned. She tries to talk to him about the inhaler and what does he want? Kiss ought to do it. What? Kiss. 
From you, right now. I don't buy it. Buy what? The act. Can't just schmooze her and romance her like the women he cons. He has to fuck with her mentally. These are some really toxic people. I don't know if you've noticed that. So he shows her the letter all, all dramatically after she says she doesn't buy the bad boy act, an act of desperation to keep one step ahead of her in the act. After his torturous temper tantrum, Kate encourages Sawyer to come play golf with everyone and instead of holding grudges, they welcome him. He just needed a little push. He doesn't have to be someone who's hated. All right, whatever the case may, whatever the case may be. Wednesday. We're stranded on an island. No one's coming for us. The new episode everyone's been waiting for. Something you want to tell me about? this little suitcase it's mine <laughs> the episode whatever the case may be despite being very emotionally detached from the episode before it where claire gets kidnapped <laughs> is a quintessential jaja kate episode jaja being uh, a reference to jack and james sawyer and jack and kate uh being a reference to uh evangeline lily's character kate i just made that up that doesn't belong to the fandom it belongs to me Sawyer and Kate, they go sexy swimming and they find a briefcase. Sawyer decides to keep it and Kate's like, I don't care about the briefcase, but she does care about the briefcase. She wants that briefcase more than anything. She tries to sneak into Sawyer's tent to steal it, but of course, you know, they do the old pinning thing again where he's like, hey, I'm pinning you and you're pinning me. Oh, how far will this go? It doesn't go Here, far. everyone has a secret. she tell you what's inside? I want the truth. And some will stop at nothing to keep it. She lied, brother. Stop lying to me. Not. Tell me the truth. In the flashback, meanwhile, Kate, he's she's robbing a bank. She pretends to be just one of the hostages in the bank lobby, but then when she gets taken hostage by the guy, she's like, hey, sugar tits, we've been planning this the whole time, haven't we? And he's like, oh, well, well yeah, of course, Maggie. I'm, I'm so smart. I'm not being conned by you at all. Easy, Maggie. Just cleaning up after myself. Hey! <laughs> That's not Maggie. <laughs> That's Kate. He's bamboozling you. How is she gonna get this from Sawyer? She convinces him. Hey, like, you're never gonna unlock that box. That's a big box. You can't unlock it. What are you trying to do? <laughs> Pick the lock on a Halliburton. <laughs> so he, like, drops it from a tree, and then she, like, comes and grabs it while he's up there. Hey! And he's like, hey, get, come, come back here. Nominated for a Golden Globe as the best drama series on television. <laughs> An all-new Lost. He pins her again and says this double entendre about the briefcase. Hell, Freckles. Knew you wanted it. Just didn't know how bad. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I'm gonna have to come up with a new one. Oh, she headbutts him. It's fucking great. Sawyer says he'll give her the briefcase as long as she tells him what's inside. So she goes to Jack. She's like, Jack, Sawyer has this case. I just spilled this on a collectible TV guide. You know what the best part about this TV guide is? What? Uh, the best part about this TV guide. The TV guide interview with John Kerry. Hell yeah, 2004 presidential candidate John Kerry. And uh, you know what? They got to they gotta appeal to both sides of the aisle. So we also got the TV Guide interview with Laura Bush right there. But the secrets of Lost is the headline. Hell yeah. <laughs> and so, like, she does this whole hullabaloo. She robs the bank. It's a big situation. A guy gets whacked on the head. All for what? Stupid Shut up, Jason. So she can get access to this bank vault, this safety deposit box with a fucking envelope in it. What's in the envelope? So she's like, Jack, can you get Sawyer to give me this case for me? And he's like, okay, sure, Kate, but you gotta tell me something about yourself. Tell me one thing about yourself. You're hiding all these secrets. I no longer like that. Back to one episode earlier. So where'd you pick up the tracking skills, Kate? Was that before or after you were on the run? I'm trying to help, Jack. You know what might help? A little honesty. Just give me something real, anything. So Jack has just ignored Claire, who told her that she was being attacked. He's clearly, like, projecting his guilt onto Kate. Where's your dead dad when you need him? It's no longer we get a fresh start on this island. Now it's you have to tell me these things, so I'm free to judge you. And Kate's like, I don't want to tell you shit. And so she explains to Kate... So she explains to Jack that the marshal is buried with the keys and they should get the case from Sawyer because there's weapons in there. Jack comes in to play sheriff, a role Kate will occasionally take on in his absence. 
Jack is able to get the briefcase back by threatening not to treat Sawyer's wound, a real macho move the con man is going to remember. But Sawyer knows Jack is playing right into Kate's hand. Who's the real fool here? All of them. And so they dig up the marshal and Jack's like, Ugh, he smells bad, because it's been a while. Uh, and uh, then Kate's like, oh, he didn't have the keys, dang. And Jack's like, caught you, because she has the keys. Jack, I don't. He's like, just tell me one thing, Kate. Just one thing, Kate. I just want to know one thing about you. Let me in, please. And then she's like, okay. And she shows him this little like toy airplane. And we're like, well, what the hell is that? What is it? I have no fucking clue who that, what that is. What, is, what does that mean, Kate? Please let us know. It belonged to the man I loved. The truth. It belonged to the man I Stop loved. Stop lying to me. Not. Tell me the truth. It belonged to the man I killed. Belonged to the man she killed. Who was that? Was that like the guy she robbed the bank with? I don't know. But anyways, Jack's like, I don't like that. You can only have a fresh start when it doesn't irritate me. I'm going to judge you now. And then she goes off like, what? Jesus Christ. When this episode aired, it was met with a bit of confusion. Being in the same stretch of episodes as Homecoming, it was kind of a confused time for the show as they continued to expand upon the flashback stories. The, the audience became confused, I think, for the first time in the series about this little plane. Its major two narratives are clearly a bit confused. The flashback story should possibly explain why Kate would want to keep the toy airplane private from Jack and Sawyer. And while the episode does help to characterize Kate as a total badass. The ultimate resolution of the episode we've been waiting for the entire time is just another new mystery. What is this plane? Which definitely contributed to the already common belief that they were just making it up as they were going along. Mom, to the man I killed! The audience doesn't know what that means, so it was very hard for them to sort of glom onto something and understand it. The show is always walking that fine line between sort of mystery and clarity. However, on a rewatch, the messiness of this episode is sort of the essential moment for the love triangle. Jack is inconsistent with how he feels about Kate's past. Kate is unable to accept what she's done, wanting every bit of herself to be kept a mystery. In spite of the over-emotional and petty disdain of Jack and Sawyer, who can't help but to let their curiosity get the better of them. I mean, Jack was right to be mad about the key, I guess. He did just dig up a dead body with her and she tried to hide it from him when there's weapons involved in the whole situation. But Kate not wanting to explain the little toy airplane, I totally get it. Jack, after he finds out that Kate is the criminal and the pilot in Tabula Rusa, has to convince himself that this is okay, that everyone is allowed to start over it new. It doesn't matter, Kate, who we were, what we did before this. He's not really telling this to Kate, he's telling this to himself because he's so like judgmental at his core. It makes sense that she would keep this little personal effect that meant so much to her from Jack. He wanted to be let in so badly, but Kate knew that he was going to judge her. And once he was let in, what did he do? He just bungles his shot. But we, the audience, are not Jack. Maybe she should have kept this private from him, but we maybe deserve to know more about Kate other than the fact that she's a badass and, and murderer. However, I know what the plane is. <laughs> I've seen the show. Jack is just like so awkward with her. Their first interaction, he gives her this speech, which is like, hey, like one time I, I was given surgery and I accidentally ripped this girl open and her guts were spilling out, but I sewed her back up and it didn't bother me that much after a few seconds. And she's like, wow, this guy's amazing. He's definitely got his head screwed right on his shoulders. He's got his shit together. He's somebody who knows what's up. He's definitely not stalking his ex-wife. I said I wouldn't give any spoilers, but what? <laughs> then in hearts and minds, she's like just kind of hanging out in the jungle and Jack's just like. <sighs> behind the trees. And she's like, you don't have to stare at me. You don't have to be secretive about it. Like, come here. And he's like, I'm going to judge you. It's not like it's a secret. Hard to tell with you sometimes. But Sawyer, Sawyer accepts her for who she is because he's aware that he, like her, also has a lot of flaws. Want to see something only I think is neat? There are premium lost trading cards. My favorite two cards, of course, are the Kate and Sawyer and the Jack and Kate card. The Kate and Sawyer card is labeled attraction. The Jack and Kate card is labeled affection. <laughs> Poor Jack. 
So the episode Outlaws has a pretty ridiculous premise, but it's just brought together by, you know, once again, the excellent performances, the flashback narratives being intercut really well with like, you know, the island narratives and all the stuff that I've talked about this whole time. So this is where we get more insight on why Sawyer chose to adopt the name Sawyer. He goes to Australia because he thinks he's found out where the real Sawyer is and he's gonna go kill him. It turns out he holds on to this letter because one day he's going to show it to the real Sawyer Sawyer, and he's going to read it to him after a big act of revenge. And so what happens on the island? A boar. A boar. Did all this. Last night, wrecked my tent. This morning, when I went to get my tent back, it attacks me from behind, runs off into the jungle like a cow. Son of a bitch! It starts raiding all of Sawyer's things, and he's like, I ain't gonna let this boar raid my things. And so he goes out into the woods to, you know, hunt it down, Captain Ahab style. And Kate's like, oh, I wanna go with you. And so Kate goes with him. And, and one night, they play Never Have I Ever. And they share, like, a bunch of information about each other with each other, something that they would never share with other people. There's clearly sparks forming between the two of them. They're both attractive murderers. Uh, I never voted Democrat. I never voted. White? <laughs> it's a really nice moment for these two murderers. And so Kate's kind of like into Sawyer again, but then his like anger gets so obsessive and weird. He starts like essentially tormenting this baby piglet to try to bring out the boar that raided his stuff, his stuff. You're sick. And Kate's like, whoa, you're being too weird about this. Like that's cruel. I'm gonna go back to camp. See you later. And Sawyer, it's back in Australia now. We're going there at this point. And he comes up to the guy. And he's like, you're the original Sawyer. I can't shoot you. And he goes to the bar and he's in Australia at the bar. And who does he see at the bar? He sees Christian Shepherd. The Sawyer may find whatever he's looking for at the bottom of a glass. Sawyer buys him a drink and they, they start talking life. And Christian Shepherd's like, I'm sad. There's all this stuff weighing down on my mind. My son, he turned me in. I don't have my doctor's license anymore. My, my name's Christian, by the way. You're, my son's about your age. Uh, and also, I wish I could call him up and tell him that I'm proud of him, that he's a bigger, he's a better doctor. <laughs> than I could ever be. And Sawyer, you're still, there's still hope for you. I'm old, there's no hope for me, but for you, like whatever's weighing on your mind, you gotta go take care of that. Cause you'll just be stupid like me and old and decrepit and regretful and all that. I wish my, I could call my son and tell him I'm proud of him. And Sawyer's like, okay, uh, I'm gonna go murder this guy. Sawyer. Turns out, it's not the real Sawyer. The, he was conned into performing a hit on some random guy. It's not the man he was trying to kill. All this anger, this is where it's brought him. It's brought him to a place where he's killing innocent people. Ugh. Sawyer, bad advice from Christian. Ain't that simple. Of course it is. Unless you want to end up like me, of course it is. I don't think Christian knew he was pushing him into murder. Oh, when he kills that guy, he's like, pow, pow, oops. Wrong man. <sighs> mm, good acting. That's just such good. Mm, that complexity that he feels when he kills that guy. Mm. And so Sawyer finally finds this boar. And he chooses not to shoot it. And guess who's watching him? It's Kate. She sees him. She sees that he's grown up. It's just a boar. But he still holds on to that letter. And then he goes back to Jack at the end of the episode, who's still just like an awkward, apprehensive person. Take him off. Trying to be funny? Yeah. And so Sawyer, he gives the gun back, and Jack's just like, eh. I was fresh out of pies to throw at you. You go, Sheriff. Eh. Sawyer's able to make a connection between Jack and Christian through a shared phrase. I made a deal with your girlfriend. What did she give you? Nothing she wasn't willing to part with. Don't beat yourself up about it. It's fate. Some people are just supposed to suffer. That's why the Sox will never win the series. That's why the Red Sox will never win the damn series. What's that? Huh? What'd you just say? 
Sawyer tries to follow up on his inclination that maybe these two are related, but Jack continues to be apprehensive. Your daddy. He a doctor too? Was. He's dead. Despite Sawyer having his guard up more than Jack has throughout the season and being much more confrontational with the others, he's definitely more of an empath than Jack and understands people, which he has used in the past to manipulate and con people, uh, but that's just something he has over Jack. I like the scene a lot because it, throughout the season we've seen Sawyer grow a whole lot, but Jack is still this person who's very standoffish and unable to explain his feelings, his emotions. What the hell is that supposed to mean? It's just something my father used to say. So he could go through life knowing that people hated him. Instead of taking responsibility for it, he just put it on fate. Said he was made that way. So much about how Sawyer and Jack feel is built just through the subtext of the performances. Like, I can see Sawyer, like, working this out in his head that... He's not worth it. Like, it would be very difficult to try to connect with this guy emotionally. Why do you want to know about my father? He's got daddy issues. And then later in, like, Born to Run, just to, like, deepen this connection to Jack, we find out who the man Kate killed was, but not the one that made her go on the run. She's already on the run in this episode. And so Kate goes to see her mom while she's on the run. Her mom's in the hospital, and she starts screaming for help when she sees Kate. Is there nowhere safe for Kate to go? Does she have any connections left? She goes to visit an old childhood friend who lets her stay with him. This plane was like a time capsule, between Kate and her childhood friend who grew up and became a doctor. Now she's a he's a goody two shoes and he she kind of looks up to him. So it's finally happened. Kate has decided she's stood in one place for too long. You know, all the characters on the island, they're getting ready to launch the raft and we find out Sawyer has gotten one of the few slots of the people who get to leave the island. When she figures out Sawyer has purchased the last ticket on the raft. So she poisons Michael to try to frame Sawyer to have him lose his ticket. But Sawyer, he's the clever con man and he figures everything out. Can't out con him. She decides she wants that ticket. Out of betrayal, he tells everyone the truth about Kate. She trusted him, and this is where it caught her. I was on the plane. Marshall. But she just messes everything up. There's a chase with the police car crash. I mean, why? how could a guy like her, how could a guy like him like a girl like her? You know, she should just be with Sawyer. Or am I talking about Jack? Josh Holloway, who do you think Kate should end up with? Probably Jack. <laughs> she runs away from the scene, leaving him and the plane, which is why it was locked in the deposit box, I guess. Why is it so important for you to be on that raft? Because there ain't anything on this island worth staying for. Saeed and Shannon are a big highlight for me. Saeed enlists Shannon's help over the course of a few episodes to translate Rousseau's notes. Shannon doesn't believe in her own ability to translate the notes because Boone's constantly always shitting on her. I'm trying to contribute something. You're just, you're useless. Did my brother put you up to this? Your brother? No. But Saeed continues to encourage her and romantic sparks start the flicker. She's able to succeed not because Saeed taught her how, but because he made her believe in her own ability, something which the people in her life were unwilling or unable to do for her. Boone, of course, does not like them together. It's really funny when he tries to go threaten Saeed, who's like this badass soldier. Stay away from my sister. For a moment, you seem to be giving me an order. That's just a friendly suggestion. A suggestion? Yes. If I were you, I'd listen. What if I don't? In the first episode, written by Carlton Cuse, Hearts and Minds, we find out Boone and Shannon's backstory. That one, they're actually step-siblings, and two, uh-oh. Time to tell something more about Shannon and Boone and their lives. You know, we knew that Boone, from his past behavior, was very possessive of Shannon, and and we thought, well, maybe it would be interesting for the audience to discover that there was 
uh, more to their relationship than just mere sort of possessive brotherly interest. They fucked. Boone is in love with Shannon. And Shannon definitely has a history of using that to her advantage. John is just weird, and his relationship with Boone only makes him weirder. People are talking about what we're doing out here every day, especially since we never come back with anything. You mean boar? Yeah. Plenty of fruit and fish to go around. What we're doing here is far more important. All the time they're supposed to be out hunting, trying to open the hatch. After Boone decides he wants to tell Shannon about it, John attacks Boone, treats his wounds, and then leaves him in the woods with a knife, being told when he finds the right motivation, he'll be able to escape the rope trap. The motivation comes when he hears Shannon screaming. The flashback sees Shannon trying to con Boone out of some money, pretending to be in an abusive relationship to trick him. But then the boyfriend takes the money and runs, leaving Shannon running back into Boone's arms, at least from his perspective. Um, she sleeps with him what? to blackmail him. When we get back to LA. That reveal is fucking incredible, but it doesn't look like the fucking was incredible. <laughs> In what is eventually revealed to be a drug trip induced by the paste lock put on Boone's head, Shannon is killed by the monster, showing Boone's obsession with her and his need to protect her. I love this moment where Shannon tries to go talk to Locke and put an end to Boone's intimidation attempts at Saeed. You like him? What? Saeed? Are you serious? Because if you do like him, what's it got to do with your brother? She decides to ignore Boone and be happy with someone who doesn't always put her down and who also isn't her brother, her stepbrother. You're a grown woman. Sure, you can yell at Boone till you're blue in the face, but all you're doing is giving him what he wants. Yeah, what's that? Your attention. Everyone gets... A new life on this island, Shannon. Maybe it's time you start yours. I love this moment with John because he gives Shannon the answer that will genuinely help her rather than just, you know, stick up for his lackey. What was that for? Everyone gets a new life on this island. I'd like to start now the sense of normalcy that's developed throughout the course of so many episodes is something we kind of want to hold on to. It creates stakes because we want the community to work. However, things always are changing on this island. They started out with resources from the plane, but slowly they lost them and their power started dying for all of their things, including Hurley's CD player. No more cozy music montages. Montage. Jack figures Sawyer may need glasses, but Sawyer doesn't want any help. But oh my, he needs it. Uh-oh, Jack's messing with him. Ha 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 ha. Taking pills for malaria? Nope. Have you ever had sex with a prostitute? Oh, Saeed and Sawyer, they, they aren't fighting anymore, so Saeed helps him create a unique pair of glasses for his vision, community, relationship growth. Nice! But with all these characters affecting each other's growth, we soon realize that may not be so great as we start to learn who these characters are more and more. Boone and John are spending all of their time trying to open the hatch. They're like father and son. Boone is like, I can help. And John's like, I'm proud of you. And Boone's like, so opening the hatch, it becomes their little project. And no matter what they do, they can't open it. They build all these elaborate things to try to get it open and try all these different things to get it open. And they don't work. It's like he built this trebuchet and it's like bang and then it's just normal and John's all upset about it uh, but then he has this vision of a yellow plane and he starts telling Boom that the island is a special place and their beliefs they're confirmed when they actually find the plane is that the plane you saw as best I can tell you really saw it yeah I really saw it However, John and Boone's relationship is complicated when we start to learn more about John's backstory. John grew up in foster care, and one day, out of nowhere, his biological mother came out of, like, nowhere. 
<laughs> and was like, John, you're immaculately conceived, which uh, makes John go and seek out his biological father who pretends to love him. They go hunting. He says, John, you're a good boy. But then he cons him out of a kidney. Mr. Cooper checked out this afternoon. He went back home. He's under private care. That doesn't make any... What? Just peeling back the layers of sadness on this guy. Which sort of kind of mirrors John's indoctrination of Boone into his weird island cult. So he gets Boone to go up and climb up to the plane and see what's up with it. And Boone just finds out it's full of statues of heroin and uh, a Nigerian priest uh, had, had flown this plane. And suddenly there's like a little radio signal coming from the radio in the plane. And Boone tries to answer it, but it's falling and he doesn't get out in time. Crash. Boone gets crushed by the plane. What did you do, John? John drags Boone back into camp, but is too emotionally distraught to explain what happened beyond Boone fell. So Jack stops up, op starts operating on him, and John, he's I've slamming down on do. the hatch. So why he, why would you do this to him? Why would you trick him and lead his lackey into death? Uh, but a light shines up through the hatch, convincing John he's still on the right path. The next episode's like an all-out medical drama. It's obvious to us, the audience, that Boone is going to die, but Jack, he can't let go of people. He's desperately trying to save Boone, even offering to amputate his leg and give him a blood transfusion with bamboo sticks. And of course, this, this story of Jack desperately trying to save this dying body is paired perfectly with the flashback story introducing us to his love life, in which he marries and fucks a patient of his he's gotta save people he's got trouble letting go <laughs> commitment is what makes you tick jack the problem is you're just not good at letting go in the flashback, we learned that at his wedding, Jack had said that he originally thought he fixed his wife, Sarah, but it turns out actually she fixed him. Okay, bro. You ever try therapy? You're a doctor. You could afford therapy. And oh my God, Claire is having her baby. Kate wants Jack to come help deliver that baby, but he can't. Boone's dying. She's going to have to deliver that baby. But in order to deliver the baby, she's going to have to stay in one place for long. But she's able to be brave and walk her through it. She stays in one place to help somebody else. Kate's arc is that she's flaky as fuck. And who helps out but the previously distant and uncomfortable Jin, who once cringed when Claire asked him to touch her stomach and now delightfully helps her during a stressful and intimate time. Before Jack can do anything desperate, Boone tells him that it's okay. It's okay, Jack. You can let go. And by the way, John and I found this hatch. We've been trying to open it, but just let me die. You can let go. You have what it takes. <sighs> then Kate and Claire walk back into camp with the baby. Once John enters back into the camp, Jack, he, he's upset. He made him let go. Where were you? And everyone else too. That's hard. Where the hell were you, you son of a bitch? John is blamed for Boone's death specifically by Shannon initially. However, once John explains the hatch and what Boone was trying to do on the plane, trying to answer the radio signal, he's head let off the hook. But not before Shannon tries to shoot him. Thank you. I did it because I sense you might be our best hope of surviving here. John has built up a lot of goodwill over the season, hunting boar, helping people, and doing random acts of kindness. If there's anyone on this island that your brother's safe with, it's locked. Like building Claire a cradle for her upcoming baby, now baby, and helping Charlie overcome his addiction. He's an essential part of their survival team, as Saeed points out. No offense, mate, but if there was one person on this island I would put my absolute faith in to save us all, it would be John Locke. 
But despite saving his life, Saeed says it's time to talk about the hatch. But this creates new tension between him, the rest of the group, and especially Jack, especially when John says shit like this. Boone was a sacrifice that the island demanded. Back in middle school, there was this position in the computer lab that wasn't really a teaching position. It was just sort of like, you know, a software instructor to teach us Word and, uh, you know, how to type and all that. And because it wasn't a teaching position, people would often rotate out of the role very frequently. And in my seventh grade, there was a guy there named Mr. Daly. And Mr. Daly and I, we got along a lot. We had a lot of the same tastes in movies and music and video games. And during pretty much the whole class, every single time I'd have that class, we would just be sitting there talking about pop culture and nerdy stuff and whatever. And so one day after one of these conversations, he goes across the classroom back to his desk and he's sitting there for a moment. And then from across the classroom, he asks me, Billy, do you watch Lost? And I had heard the name before, but I thought it was a ripoff of Survivor, and I had seen trailers for it on G4, but uh, I wasn't really interested in it. I was a little dumbfounded, he would ask, so I, I said no. And from across the classroom, he said, screw you, just in front of everyone, because uh, I, I didn't watch Lost. And then that summer, it was close to after my birthday, had a little coin in my pocket, and I was at the mall, and I went into the FYE, and what do I see? I see Lost, season one, used and I buy it. And over that summer, I watched it like crazy and I became obsessed with it. But then when I got back to school, Mr. Daly was gone. So Mr. Daly, I've watched Lost. I like it. Screw you. <laughs> But before the finale comes around, a few important things happen. First, a walk-on extra character, Arts, who uh, landed on the plane with everyone else, explains that because of the hurricane and wind season, they have to get the raft off the island very soon. The first season of Lost is like the length of some TV shows at this point. By the time the finale comes around, we have been through so much with these characters and their relationships have developed in such a uniquely deep way because we have watched them all interact with each other through so many different scenarios. And between the slow burn relationship development and the consistently good production value, the finale comes in and the stakes are at an all time high and it's just, you know, exciting. One day, Russo comes back into camp with news. The others are coming and they're gonna take the child, Aaron. This is indicated, of course, by a mysterious smoke signal and all the voices she heard in the woods, ooh. Unlike the two-part pilot, the three-part finale, Exodus, aired over two weeks, with part one airing before parts two and three. It's, 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 it's an epic movie, essentially. There's like so much. Well, this finale's really exciting. One of the things I really love about it that Lost would continue to do throughout its run is how it bookends the first and the last episode. In the first episode, we didn't really have have a single character to follow. We were following a few of the people on the plane and as a beautiful bookend to that idea, in the finale, we start to see everybody the morning of the flight. But you're getting on that plane. No, I'm not. Hey, what's going on? It's okay, I'm his father. No, you're not. You're not my father. You're not my father. It's so hard to highlight moments from the finale because there's so many. I love Jin apologizing to Sun, having interpreted his time on the island as a punishment for how he's treated her. But now he's determined to sail the raft off the island and rescue everyone so they can start their new life. To me, the most important character development through this season is in the finale when Sawyer finally decides to tell Jack about his meeting with his father. It turns out, this guy has a son. Son's a doctor, too. They'd had some kind of big time falling out. The guy knew it was his fault. Even though his son was back in the States thinking the same damn thing. These two sharing a vulnerable emotional moment together, which allows Jack to have closure on the thing that's been affecting him the entire season, to me, uh, is a really powerful scene. It's a powerful moment. 
Christian. Tells me he wishes he had the stones to pick up the phone, call his kid. Tell him he's sorry. He's a better doctor than he'll ever be. He's proud. It's only when these two meatheads are able to put aside their differences and have this conversation that Jack is finally able to fit in properly as the role of the leader because his daddy was proud of him. Small world, huh? Yeah. The first season of Lost still is an incredible season of television. And from both the production standpoint and story standpoint, it was an incredible undertaking. There was so much creative and emotional weight going into everything. And it all had to work for Lost to be good. And just to kind of give you an example of how this all comes together, here's a clip of Jack Bender describing how he directed the scene versus how it was written. It was a little tentative, hey, see you later. I I said, this is a big deal, guys. I said, this is the first part of your tribe that's both leaving the island, they may not survive the voyage, and they are essential to your survival. Aside from that, these are people you've bonded with. Don't deny who you are and who you've been to each other. But it's, you know, I don't think it's so much about the reticence. Of, it's more about this is a moment in our lives and there is hope here and there's a goodbye here and we've got to honor that. So we rolled the cameras and they went for it. And I told the cameras, just follow them. Just stay with the people. And at one point when we launched the raft, I said to our dog trainer, does he like the ocean? She said, yes, if I'm out there. I said, okay, I want him to swim as if he's following the raft. And God bless the dog and Kim, the trainer. She got out on the raft, the dog swam out, turned around at one point. Go back, Vincent, go back. It was wonderful. So for every dog lover in America, and I include myself, high on the list, it's gonna be a major moment. The launching of the raft may just be the greatest moment of community triumph throughout the entire series. It's a testament to the entire story that came before it, as well as its execution. Wanting to use the hatch to hide from the others, Russo explains that she got dynamite from the Black Rock, so a team heads off there in order to collect it to open the hatch, revealing the Black Rock to be a slave ship that had mysteriously landed in the middle of the jungle. They go to the Black Rock to get dynamite, and Arts dies as he's explaining how delicate they have to be with the dynamite. The glycerin is extremely temperamental. So we it's a great introduction for a character just to kill them off. <laughs> On their way back to blow up the hatch in order to open it, they're confronted by the monster. There's like a weird, there's like a weird CG big bird. Whoever named this place Dark Territory? Genius. It sounds like it's fighting with something. What's that little wispy smoke thing? Oh, they gotta get out of there. It's like a thing of smoke and it wraps itself around John's legs and tries to drag him into a hole and John's like, no, I'm gonna be okay. Don't worry, this thing won't kill me. And Jack's like, what the fuck are you saying? They drop dynamite on it and John's able to escape. Now that thing was taking you down the hole and you asked it me wasn't to let you go. Hurt me. No, John, it was gonna kill you. I seriously doubt that. But Rousseau uses this opportunity to stay behind at the beach camp to kidnap Aaron in order to trade for her child, Alex. But when she arrives to the smoke signal, she finds out it's just a decoy. But Rousseau insists she did hear the others say they wanted to kidnap a child. Certainly they must have met Aaron. Back on the raft, they start to pick up an object on their radar and they decide to use their only flare to try to get its attention. And it's a fishing boat. They're gonna be rescued. But then the other shoe drops. We're gonna have to take the boy. What? What'd you say? They're gonna get the that Walt. We're gonna have to take him. The others, they take Walt and they blow up the raft. Later, when everyone's getting ready to open the hatch, John and Jack discuss their conflicting ideas of destiny and fate. I believe that I was being tested. Tested, yeah. With Jack asking John directly why he wasn't afraid of the monster. I think that's why you and I don't see eye to eye sometimes, Jack. Because you're a man of science. Yeah. What does that make you? Me? Well, 
I'm a man of faith. And John kind of confronting Jack, asking him why he's unable to accept a lot of the weird things that have happened on the island. Did you say something? No. With the characters continuing to discover coincidences between them all. I heard 23. Does that mean something to you? What? That number? 23? The guy who called the feds on me back in Australia did it for a $23,000 reward. Destiny and fate would soon become concepts they'd all be very familiar with. A group of strangers survived, many of us with just superficial injuries. Do you think we crashed on this place by coincidence? Especially this place? We were brought here for a purpose, for a reason, all of us. Each one of us was brought here for a reason. But this converse, but we, but we don't really come back to this conversation until the next season. And where's that path end, John? The path ends at the hatch. The hatch, Jack. With an irony that our beach camp people are actually safe because the others were trying to kidnap Walt, they're finally able to open the hatch, but not before Hurley notices that the numbers are imprinted onto it. He tries to warn them not to open it, but the dynamite what, goes off. You gotta stop it, the numbers are bad! Stop! What are you doing? Why'd you do that? The final flashback sees Hurley rushing to board the plane, which of course he is late for his bad luck. You see all the characters we know board the plane and have short interactions with each other. Hurley makes Walt smile. We find out the Spanish comic book Walt was reading actually belongs to him. And then Jack awkwardly smiles to John and you know, it's the kind of interactions you may have on an actual flight, but there's such a poetic quality to it because we know these characters will all get to know each other other in such an intimate and even disturbing way, which leads us into the final moments of the episode of the season. John and Jack look down the hatch and we continue to go down the rabbit hole. Lost is a show that was made in a very different era of TV, but honestly, I think that's what makes it so unique. It's the combination of the slow burn, long drawn out nature of network television, which allows us to feel so much connection to these characters. But you combine that with the serialized story, which has real consequential changes for the show's setting, it ends up resulting in a really cool story. But by going down the hatch, we'd end up getting a window into the larger world of the show and with the whole season of hype around it it had a lot to live up to spoilers ahead lost we have to go back now. hey there's a certain gargantuan quality about this thing then don't and the emmy goes to lost <laughs> All the uh, amazing people on this stage and also in Hawaii, uh, thank you for believing in our show. And the Emmy voters, thank you for believing in our show. And ABC, thank you for believing in our show. Touchstone, thank you for believing in our show. Uh, we know it can be frustrating, bear with us. Uh, but we, we could not feel uh, more gratitude to all the people who uh, let us do the work, our wives, our families, our mommies, our daddies. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for getting lost with us. Uh, we are really, really appreciative. Thank you, God bless. Okay, now like I made it out alive of season one and people seem to like it and we won the Emmy, uh, now what? So by the time the Emmys happened, which was in September, I believe, like we were very, we were already very deep in the second season of the show. Do you ever think that maybe they put you down here to push a button every hundred minutes just to see if you would? That all of us, the computer, the button, is just a mind game, an experiment. Every single They've thing. attacked us, sabotaged us, abducted us, murdered us. Not the only people on this island, and we all know it. It's one of them. My name is Henry Gale. I'm from Minnesota. Disney CEO Michael Eisner was so upset about the success of Lost, he became weak for just long enough to allow conniver Bob Iger to usurp him as CEO of the Walt Disney Corporation, who, probably in spite of the success of Lost, would never, ever, 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 ever 
allow the company to create an original idea again. I thought at the beginning we were on track. Like the first season, I was, I'm was. i still proud of. The end of the second, definitely the third. Um, you know, they were, I think they were winning it. Dazzle, dazzle! And, the, and then the show basically ends after about three years. That was the initial pitch. And they were not even hearing. There was an official Lost magazine, which we'll get Number into. Number two, I will appoint a committee to find out what the heck is happening on Lost. They, it, they looked at particularly me, and Carlton came on about midway through season one, and he joined the chorus of me. But they were just like, do you understand how hard it is to make a show that people want to watch? So if you've made it to the end of the video, thank you so much for indulging me and allowing me to indulge myself in such a long project. I mean, there's still a bit more of it left. Five seasons. <laughs> but I'll be getting back to regular content in the meantime. I mean, I already have like two and three seasons, two and three mostly filmed, but I got a lot to add. So other videos in the meantime. So anyways, I'm tired, I'm stressed, I'll see you soon.